we are are live. Joe Sisman. How are Grant you doing? Moore. Dude, I'm great. Yeah? I can't. <laughs> I'm totally great. I sent this to, a, I DM'd this to a bunch of people. They have been sending me screenshots of the waiting, <laughs> uh, whatever that waiting, mm -hmm. you know, thing is on their TVs. And they are super stoked for me to, to talk about this, like, very openly and uh, with no filter and no censorship. Have you ever done this before? Talking about uh, it like this. Uh, let me think. I've been writing about it yeah. and I've been telling uh, my friends about it. I don't know. I don't know on Factor Freestyle if we got into all of it. I think what we were doing was um, leaving little clues mm. around. That makes sense. And so because what I've been doing is like chumming the water. <clears throat> like if you if you watch uh, the foot, my footprints in, in the spam Instagram, yeah. I'm dropping little, little clues and it's all going to lead up to my 50 year edit where I tell the whole thing and I show the evidence, uh, and it's the big trick and I tell the whole pursuit of it. So that's, I'm super stoked on that. And I have been giving some folks some preview of it. Um, but not the full story. That's yeah. awesome. I love that you're like. <laughs> You're like, what is it, the, the Marvel Universe? You're like dropping hints. You know, you see a little yeah. bit of Thanos in there. And then all of a sudden, boom, we're at Infinity War. <laughs> so I, I suppose we should maybe not uh, tease people any longer. The topic of conversation today is a concept called frog bars. Frog bars, indeed. And... Um, why don't I just say what frog bars is, and then we can deal with all of the details later so frog bars one sec ready? before you go crazy okay <laughs> yeah before, you lead this one yeah, before you go super crazy i just i mean the first thing i have here is define frog bars but what i wanted to preface this with for yeah. people on the outside that's a weird way to say it but <laughs> they're all going to be on the inside soon yeah i'm going to do my best personally to not sound super super crazy in all of this and at first glance <laughs> and when you first hear all of this you're gonna be like this dude is nuts these dudes are nuts like what are they talking about but the thing about it is is that this concept and i can only i had to stop you before you defined it and said what it is because i have to say this part before you actually say it everyone has experienced what we're going to talk about tonight Yes. Everyone yes. has experienced yes. it, whether it's singing a song and then it comes on the radio when you get in your car or it's thinking about a friend and then getting a call or a text in that moment of your friend that you're thinking about from that person. We've all experienced it. And I'll say before we define it, too, that I've always felt like there was something to that, you know, the, oh, I'm singing a song. And then all of a sudden I get in the car and it's on like, what the hell? And, oh, I got friends that I like, that I'm thinking about. And then I get a call or a text. Whoa. I've always felt like there was more to that than it just being like by chance. And so with that, I feel like we can safely let you get loose on your, from your leash. All right, um, I'm gonna start with the big one. Uh, Frog Bars is an alien entity sent to Earth to find and forge fitting humans into proper vessels for the Stoke. <laughs> Put that into terms everyone can understand. Uh, Chad DeGroot, who arguably is an alien, one day randomly sent me this, this, ooh, ooh, I can show this photo. This. Yeah. <clears throat> and what I said to him was, the first thing that came to mind was, that is an that is an alien frog sent to Earth to help to give people wisdom. Now, it took on a life of its own. One week after that, 
uh, after my coronation as the uh, as the, the the newest member of the Plywood Hoods, which is the greatest team of all time. Uh, I had a I was in Hyperstoke, and I had it was like a lucid dream, and this entity spoke to me like the most amazing words I had heard. And those words were, all your life, I have been playing chess. All your life, you have been playing chess with me. I have been playing chase with you. Those are damn good words. So where did they come from? Well, I attributed this to frog bars and I started to tell people about it. I was like, couple amazing things have happened in my life in the past 24 hours. One, I was coronated into the plywood hoods. Two, I was visited in my dream uh, <laughs> by an entity that said, all your life, you have been playing chess with me and I have been playing chase with you. And I was like, uh, now I have to go figure out what that means. And that's, that's, it's quite a thing to go and figure out what it means. And uh, uh, w w when I am in states of hyper stoke, like I'm working on this edit. And so I'm super focused on breaking down this trick into all these component parts, training them. And everything in my life is super regimented. And what happens when you get into a training mode like that, you notice every tiny little anomaly that doesn't fit like the routine that you have and you yeah. start paying attention to the anomalies and then the anomalies tend to rhyme. And so when you're really, really working on a video project or any project, particularly when you're reviewing a storyline or a timeline, you start to see how things mm -hmm. synchronistically fit together. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it felt like there was another storyteller in the mix. And I started writing down, what was happening this is so interesting so to kind of like dip in here a little bit and go back and forth you know the interesting thing that you said is that the frog bars thing so like you called this frog bars from the start like this is yeah that is yeah interesting to me because that means that the name frog bars came before the concept of frog bars to you when did it happen? Uh, I called it, it is a, what I said to Chad was, this is an alien frog. It was like a very short number of minutes later that the term frog bars came and it just sounded so, it had a good mouthfeel as they say. <laughs> yeah. And, and with that, did you already have the concept behind it or did the concept behind what you're we're calling frog bars come after the actual picture itself. I had, uh, in around 2005, I found a podcast that taught, uh, a whole, a Polynesian shamanism. And so I got really into that and it talks about like how you can interpret the world through several levels. And one of the exercise, the couple exercises, one was if you, if you think about a blue feather, it's called the blue feather exercise, and you just look for a blue feather, you will find a blue feather. Yeah. And it's going to happen like super fast. And uh, w whenever you choose to go and look for the blue feather, you find a blue feather. And then that ends up having, that, that, that's meaningful in your life. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is, uh, was how you interpret your dream. So everybody says like, oh, I had the craziest, craziest dream. Um, and the method that they teach for interpreting dreams is every character in the dream is a reflection of you because it's happening in your head, ergo, what else could it be? Mm -hmm. And so you can ascribe meaning uh, by decoding your dreams. The uh, symbolic way, like the next level way of interpreting your life is to interpret your life as it, as if it were a dream and look at all of the things of significance, <clears throat> excuse me, that you make note of, and then ask yourself, how would I read this if it were, if it were a dream? And this will give you, this will do things like if you, um, if you, uh, if you get a flat 
at the beginning of your run, uh, but then you fix it, but then your second run, something works out great. Like you can see how those little uh, derailments can nudge you in the right direction or you take little clues from that. And you've told me stories about this yourself. I have a perfect thing here too in the other direction of, oh, you fix it and then you land something amazing in that there's a lot of moments I feel like we uh, don't know about because, oh, you get a flat in your first run, then at, you fix it. I don't know, you might get, say you get three runs and you get a flat in your second <clears throat> run, so you don't take your third run because yeah. you're like, this is a sign from the universe saying stop and something's going to happen. We've all experienced those moments where you're like, this is a sign from the universe Tell them, try to tell me something. I don't, maybe it's like, hey, you probably shouldn't be trying this. But we all know those moments. And so what you're saying is that you you studied this, this thing back in 2005, I think you said. Yeah. And so did you like follow up on it through time? And then that's what became the Frog Bars concept to you? Uh, I think that... Um... And the way I say it in my zine is you can't live in the monastery all the time. Like you have to come out of studying this stuff to live in the regular world and see mm. how it works. And so like I had studied Huna like intensely and then I'd let it lag and then I, it was just would go up and down. Um, but it, I, I think it helped me with the framework of how to interpret this. The thing that I think really kind of did it to me was um, when Maurice Meyer and Gork told a told told the story of 43 mm. and um that kind of reignited it and all bmxers know the story of 43 or they know like about 43 maybe not necessarily the origin story of 43 <clears throat> but like one of the other things i do on um on footprints in the spam is when i see a movie and there's a reference to 43 like the new eddie murphy movie when he's checking out when he, uh, the cash register pops up like a dollar forty three, or in the Italian job, uh, Charlize Theron uh, cracks the safe in four minutes and forty three seconds, and I'm like that meme of Leonardo DiCaprio, like, <laughs> oh yeah. <clears throat> so, the, um, the forty three uh, originated out of skate culture in NorCal, and. Uh, it caught on with like um, the like freestyling. So it was it was Spike and Andy Jenkins, um, I think Mike Daly as well, and it sort of made its way through. But like you can see you can see it appear in in in, in movies like Hollywood. Uh, somebody was sent me um, the Big Bang Project or whatever that TV show was. Big Bang Theory, yeah. Big Bang Theory they drop 43s in there all the time. And so it becomes kind of like the secret handshake. Um, and there's, so there's like synthetic 43s, which is like Charlize Theron in the Italian job saying that she cracked the safe in four minutes and 43 seconds. But then there are like naturally occurring 43s. And if you like, you can see it in um, like my exit sign. Okay. So when I bought, uh, when I bought my, renovated schoolhouse apple maps was taking me down exit 42 and we did that episode the 43 and i was like let me just see what the next exit was and like so now i will only get off the highway on exit 43 oh, yeah. to get to my house right like so you, like you see these things stacked up um and uh, you know the, the way I, here's what i would say this is a note that i took you can, you know, you can encounter this experience. You can replicate this experience, yeah. Brett, that you and I are talking about. Yep. A reasonable start of the journey is to discover the forty-three, and then to hear the story of forty-three. And we have this on episode season one, episode forty-three of Factor Freestyle. Um, then to observe the story of forty-three to participate in the story of 43, to pursue the story of 43, and then to pursue the understanding of the story of 43. I think that had a lot to do with um, uh, making my life a fertile ground for 
the emergence of frog bars because if you don't believe the 43, you cannot see frog bars. That makes sense. You have you have to you have to believe it in order in, in, to see it. You will see it when you believe it. It kind of blows my mind to hear all of this and to think about the fact that like somehow I stumbled and came across this concept a hundred percent on my own, <laughs> like right with no influence whatsoever and. I feel like we've gone this far we into it. We, we went deep really fast. <laughs> so I, I want to like try and come back a little bit for yep. uh, people who might not totally like be like, okay, I know what they're talking about now. <laughs> so like a great example of this, we are, I already mentioned it with the, the flat tires thing. We talked about that. Like people always talk about signs from the universe. Like yes. literally people always say that. Oh, it's a sign from the universe, sign from the heavens, whatever it might be. And like, that is what we're talking about, but in a like conscious manner. So like you mentioned synchronicity. So I had always called this serendipity throughout mm -hmm. my life and yeah. it was just because that was the only word that i knew for it and i was like oh yeah this totally makes sense it's like a it's a serendipitous moment of just everything in the universe aligning for this moment that says hey you're in the right place at the right time doing exactly what you're supposed to do and then somebody clued me in that no it's not serendipity because serendipity implies that it's random it's yeah. synchronicity, which implies that there is a design to it. And I'm not, this is where people are like, okay, this guy's crazy. Cause I'm not trying to say, I mean, I don't know if I believe that everything is like already done and that we're just like living it and that there's already a design to everything, but it, I can't help but feel like there's some kind of like order maybe. Does that make sense? Uh it does make sense. And so, uh, as I've looked at this, it, it, if you, you can look at your life experience this way and it becomes a tool mm -hmm. that helps you make sense of the situation enough that you can spot the opportunity to get, to get yourself out of a situation or into an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, and so if you're always looking at the world as being completely random, then what, like, what is your opportunity? Where's your hope? Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, um, you know, in, let's see, uh, you know, Bob, Bob Ross would say uh, it's a happy accident. Yeah. Um, if you are, if you're, I know more, way more about Flatland than I do about ramps. And so if you have an experience like, like, cause you do a lot of tech stuff. So yeah. you probably have a lot of the same mechanics. Um, but in Flatland, uh, if you, you know, it is possible to make a mistake in Flatland that sends that sends you into a completely different balance point. Uh, and if you have like a survival instinct, like I'm not going to touch, I'm not going to touch, I'm not going to touch, you'll be able to dig deep to find what the next forces are that you're in. Yeah, and pull out. And so you'll see like these miraculous saves. Um, those weren't like the, the throw of a dice that that was following following that balance point as far as it can go by um, by feeling it and being like really immersed in it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to if let, let's say what would happen otherwise, if you said, oh, I, I screwed up. Oh, this is I'm just going to walk out of this trick. There's no way to save it. You'd be out of that. You'd be out of the trick. You'd be you'd be done. Right. Um, but holding on and looking for the next way that this can all make sense uh, actually can save your trick. Yeah. OK, so 100 percent. And I can kind of uh, give the ramp like non flatland mindset behind that, too, since it is a little bit different just because the the style of riding is different. Uh, yeah. And I can kind of go into my next note here in that whole thing. Like we already talked about, you know, it might seem all crazy, but this is the part of the conversation that I think can help people understand like the easiest way, you know, like it's no different than when people say like, go with the flow. Mm -hmm. the frog, like, it's essentially the same thing. 
But uh, what I'm getting at here is like when you're trying a trick, you said you, it might force you or put you into a different position. You you save it and you stay with it and it takes crazy routes. Every single BMX rider who has like filmed a video or consistently films for things knows this process of like, oh, I'm trying something, but then something else happens. And if you pay attention to it, then you can keep going with that something else and go away from the thing that you were originally trying and end up with something that it might be better. It might be totally different. Who knows what it might be, but going with the flow of yeah. where you ended up is kind of exactly what, what we're talking about here, but just applying that to life. And so I had written down here, like, if you're trying to do something and it feels like everything is pushing you in another direction in life, how often does forcing your original intent just not work out or works out badly? It, it just feels like forcing things like that is just not, not what you're supposed to be doing. I, um, I had an experience like that when I, um, when I was young, I want to say I was 20 I, th th when I was 20, Lollapalooza was not a three-day concert series in Chicago. It was a traveling show, and I was contracted. I was selling shrimp rocks. I didn't call them shrimp rocks at the time, but shout out to Large Ray. Uh, I call them shrimp rocks now. And <clears throat> I remember logistically how challenging that tour was because sometimes, like, we would drive 500 miles overnight. Super, super stressful. And we get to the final show in Los Angeles and um, my driver uh, had a boyfriend who had a friend and we stayed in Santa Monica for like a week. And I, I had, uh, I was just able to relax and sort of decompress and, and look at my whole situation is like, dude, you were like, you spent, you spent an entire summer on the road uh, touring with all these bands. Uh, can you just, zoom out and look at all of that and have a different perspective. And it gave me such a wonderful feeling. Um, I went back and figured out a tattoo to like uh, uh, embody that feeling. But that, that, that was an early sense that if you literally shift your perspective away from like how you're seeing it to how you might see it looking back in the future, uh, that changes massively. Mm -hmm. um, and in a lot of ways, I think that this frog bars thing is like a future point of view that somehow clicks. It's like, it's like future me looking back or an alien entity. I got um, this. The hypotheses are, are, are forming and I'm, I'm studying. So, so, so why am I studying all this? Uh, uh, I am the creative director of the Teradome sports science research center. And we study uh, uh, athletic performance. And so there's all sorts of mind games that go into athletic performance. And I just so happened to have stumbled upon a couple of these things. Dane Beardsley and Zach came one, uh, one, one time and uh, Dane looks at me and he goes, do you always burn incense? And I'm like, yeah, these came from the Dalai Lama's monks because I had like Tibetan incense and it was stinking up the place. And I was like, that's how I get into the mental state mm -hmm. that like, that's how I shut off. That's how I shut off the time. Um, that's how I shut off what I did that day at work. And, and when I have incense, uh, the same incense, uh, burning at the terror dome, then the, and like, I, I had the sense when I was shooting for master creativity, I played the same song over and over as I was trying to get my trick. And what happened was I lost track of time and I would have the sense that every time I went back to reset the camera, that was, that was, that was the point of my life to which I was coming back. Like mm. in groundhog day, like he woke up the same time, but I had, I had structured the whole environment such that when I went back to reset the camera, it was the first time I had reset the camera. Like it wasn't the oh, 500th yeah, time that, that I'd reset the camera. And this was like over the span of months. So there's lots of those types of um, 
training techniques that we refine and I document and I, I, I work them out. And then the evidence that the training regimen works is the trick that I end up doing on video. Yeah, I get you. That makes total yeah. sense. Um, man, it's crazy that we can say all of this stuff and I still feel like it's like, how do we explain this in a way that people can digest very easily? <laughs> it's just, I don't know that. Every, everyone digests it differently. So um, I'll give you an example of that. You and I shared, I don't know, 20, 25 words. And you were like, I know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. S Stoney and I shared, I don't know, 50 words, something like that. And he was like, wait a second. I think I get what you're talking about. Stoney <laughs> sent me a video of him explaining to his mother frog bars. And she was ready to lock him up. <laughs> <laughs> and it, was, it was so funny because I was like, all right, there's some people that if you explain this to them, like you can't push it on them. Like what I do with frog bars uh, and with the memes and stuff like that is uh, uh, I describe it with a smile on my face with comical uh, – under comical circumstances and then that becomes the next breadcrumb mm. for someone to eat until they see that okay well it's it's uh you know is it friend or is it foe well it's friend but here's why it's friend and you can have fun with the concept and you can talk about these neat little um synchronicities you can talk about 43 people can have fun with 43 but they don't have to jump to like I'm actually talking to an alien entity. What are the what are the implications of that, right? And so what I'm doing is I'm telling the story as I'm laying down little bits at a time that people can chew on at their mm. at their own rate. When I was when I was doing the Lollapalooza thing, um, I think a lot of this started out of out of rock and roll because if you go on tour with rock and rollers, um, you're going to hear a lot. You're going to hear a lot of stuff. And some of it is going to be on point. Other of it is not. Uh, but, but it's a stiff drink, bro. Like yeah. when you listen to rock and rollers, talk about this stuff, touring rock and rollers, the things that they've seen, um, the stories that they've heard, uh, it's quite a lot. And so if you want to tell, in my view, if you want to tell the story, um, you got to leave the breadcrumbs and you got to let the person who is the story experiencer go at their own rate. Yeah. Right. You got to let them go at their own rate. And that's why I'm just throwing little breadcrumbs all over. And in fact, that's kind of like, um, <clears throat> I came up with the name footprints in the spam a long time ago when it was, um, it was a tumbler thing. Mm. And I was like, cause you know, there's that footprints in the sand, um, yeah. poem. And so I was like, wait a second, you know, in this digital world, you get all sorts of crap coming at you. Oh, I instantly got the name. <clears throat> right. So and keep so, going. And so my strategy was make absurd jokes, make ridiculous jokes, but layer in little breadcrumbs. <clears throat> some people will get it. Some people will say, Joe, you're absolutely crazy. Uh, I've got a, I've got a homie in, uh, in Houston, I think he's the actual underground mayor of Houston. His name is Hector Garcia. And I layer these jokes with him. Uh, he loves that stuff. But like, but Hector's also a designer. He's kind of a creative type. And so some people will get it right away. Other people, like, other people won't. Like, if you find someone who just wants to, well, if you find someone who just wants to be a booty shaking Instagram model, Good luck, bro. Like if you're <laughs> like, just do not, do not attempt to go there because what they're, what they're trying to get out of life is, is not, it, it's not the way, bro. It's not, it's not about athletic performance. It's not about doing NBDs. And let's be, let's be honest. We're in BMX right now. Uh, and BMX culture, uh, values creativity and it values never been done mm -hmm. because the thing about what's tricks that have been never been done is no one can teach you those tricks. Oh uh, yeah. 
And so if you want to do NBDs, you like you have to find a way to do something that no you have to find a way to learn something that no one can teach you. That's an interesting concept to part of to like understanding part of why other than just like the cool factor of doing an NBD and just being the first person to do it, like the psychology behind NBD and why people may unconsciously care as much as they do, which is really interesting to think about because I that's one of the things I've never I've never even considered why an NBD is so like magical. Um, so we're almost through all of my prequel things that would need to come before <laughs> everything. And like the last thing that I had in what we were talking about with just like going with the flow and like the concept of this stuff before I talk about my experience with it is just like, i personally feel like in life, things just go so much smoother and feels so much better when you go with that flow of things than when you're trying to just force everything and make sure everything happens exactly the way that you want it to or you envision it in your head. And it's funny that I say that because it's the same. Like if you told Victoria that I just said that, she'd be like, really? Because I am always like, all right, we need to go and get there and do this and whatever. But the entire way through that journey, I'm paying attention. And like if something comes up and it's like, oh, shouldn't go that route. All right, we're making a left turn and we're going the other direction in all of this. It's like there's a certain level of structure, but being open to change that that is really important. So like basically it's just like accepting that there's a certain level of not being in complete control. Oh yeah. That, oh, that makes life and makes everything <clears throat> easier and that ultimately comes down to like my experience of the concept that we call frog bars so i guess i'll just get right into my personal experience with all of this because this is something that like this is crazy you're you're so you're stoked right now like, i'm super stoked because i don't i mean you're the first person i've ever talked to who recognizes this concept before I tell them about it. And it's like, this isn't something that I like sought out to find. It was like, and it's not something that I was like, I'm going to live. This is religion for me. And <laughs> like, like yeah. but it kind of turned into that a little bit yeah. as weird as it sounds, but where all of this started for me is just me going with the flow and being open to like, whatever I feel like the universe might be trying to tell me that whole concept of like the universe is, it's a sign from the universe, whatever. It's like me going through life, paying attention. And what first clued me into this stuff is the moments of, Oh, singing a song. And then it comes on the radio, texting a friend and then, or talking about a friend, thinking about a friend, then they text you or they call you. And it's just like, basically I took, all of those signs from the universe as a literal sign saying you are in the exact place you're supposed to be at the time you're supposed to be there doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing in that moment of your life. And the more it happens to you, the more it means you're doing exactly what you're supposed to. And, and I was like, you know, you recognize me and that's kind of a crazy way to live, right? Like, what are you doing? You're just like popping along, waiting for signs from the universe. And it's like, but I recognize at the same time, I was like, what, what could this possibly hurt? You know, I'm, I'm literally just yeah. living normal life. And then if something is like, oh, we have two different thoughts for what we're going to do. And then some random sign pops up. It's like, oh, well, I guess that's what we're supposed to do. So we'll just do that. It's like it's inconsequential in most of those things. Yeah, 100 percent. Like there, there's this saying called um, getting your sea legs. Have you ever heard this? I mean, I use that when I talk about trail legs for riding trails. But yeah. Pro yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Yeah. Sea legs is uh, if you're a landlubber. 
uh, you're used to like walking and locking your knees and the horizon line doesn't change, but mm. if you are a sailor, you literally have to get your sea legs mm. in that, like your feet, you know, like it's like yep. when you hold a chicken and then you move the, the yep. chicken's body, the chicken the, the head stays in the same. Yep. Yeah. Um, shout out to Ohio and chickens. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but like that, 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 that it, it's, it's a way of, of stabilizing your, uh, call it horizon line or just stabilizing your, your perspective while everything else is, is shifting. Yep. So yeah, it's called sea legs. Um, and you know, like when you set out, when you set out on a like road trip, like you, you will have a destination in mind. You may have, you may hit a detour. You may have stormy weather. You may have to turn, mm-hmm. you know, take another route to it. That's in in some ways you could say that's kind of going with the flow because you had a plan, like you had to trip like right, left turn, this highway to that highway. Uh, but somewhere along the way, either you wanted to, 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 to take a scenic route or there was a boulder in the way and you didn't just sit there and like cry. It, like, it's not like your mission was over when you couldn't take the path yeah. because your mission was not to take a sequence of roads. Your mission was to get to that destination out there. And your mind came up with plan number one that seemed feasible, but you got to be adaptive. And if you get stuck or you, fi- you find a- another way or you find another way that like you're interested in, go that other way. But you haven't changed your destination. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly the concept of what I'm talking about. And so that's kind of how I got clued into this. It was just like paying attention to those things and then recognizing that my life just was better when I did this. Like yeah, things word. just things just happened better. It felt like like when you give up a certain level of control with things and you let you go with the flow of it. It's like, well, I'm not as stressed out about stuff because it's like, well, that's the whatever. That's just what happened. So we're going to go with the flow and whatever it is. And and then you it also takes away like maybe some people love making decisions, but I feel like a lot of people just don't don't necessarily like making decisions so some of it is like fun to just leave it up in the air of like, well, when the sign from the universe comes, I'll I'll follow that sign. And that's going to be what makes the decision for me rather than me like dwelling on it and stressing over it. And so like, go ahead, if you're going to say something. Yes. All I'm going to say is <laughs> word. So this is what blows my mind is like, this is all just me like. This is me living my life. I came up with this on my own living. I didn't even tell people about it for a long time because it was just, it was like subconscious. It was not yeah. even something that I really intentionally did. It just happened. And then, so I, I'm going to ask you to share your first memory of this right after, because I don't want to forget where I'm going. I'm going to, yeah. I can't, so like, I can't remember the very first time that this happened to me. But what I can remember is the first time that it was like significant enough of things lining up that I was like, bro, all right, I'm done. This is real. There's no denying this. It's just, I, all right, this is a thing now. And I'll tell that story as quickly as I can. <laughs> so, so we were at Woodward for the first USA BMX freestyle uh, championship. It was during COVID. They had the digital, the digital series where you submitted like a, a video for a video contest as part of this thing. And then the championship was the only physical contest. And through this USA BMX thing, I actually like talked with Shane Fernandez and kind of gave my input and insights on how I felt like it made sense to do things and just whatever they took my input on that and it was it blew my mind that i was even part of that then yeah then we announced the whole thing for the first time of it being public on my youtube channel so so it was like whoa this is crazy again and then i'm actually there and i'm filming the championship that this is this thing that i helped with the creation of and some of the concepts behind it and then i and helped announce it 
now I'm here and I'm filming it and I walk up and like just one of the moments that was significant to me was like walking up to lot eight and I'm with my girlfriend Victoria and the dude who's standing there in this group of people is Tony D, which I didn't know who Tony D was at the time. Like I had no idea. And he looks at us and he points and he's like, oh, you two, you're just like two little peas in a pod. And I'm like, who are, who is this guy? <laughs> like, I don't even know. This guy freaking helped Dave Mira and Ryan Nyquist, like with some pinnacle moments in BMX history. And I have no idea who he is. <laughs> like, so this is my weekend. And then we're leaving Woodward. And I tell Victoria as we're on our way out, I was like, I don't know why, but I feel like things are just going to be different moving forward. Like mm-hmm. this is a, this is like one of those milestone moments of just life is going to be different now. So we pull out of Woodward and we're driving home. We're listening to a, a JRE Joe Rogan podcast with Bill Burr. She's sleeping and they're talking about how in the past, uh, comedians didn't let's let me try and be a little more specific so they were talking about how just like four or five years ago comedians had to be more careful about the things that they were saying because people were just cancel culture was super even more crazy than it is now and it was and so uh they were talking about that whole concept and bill burr goes i i I didn't, I, I did that, but like he, he made a comment about looking over his shoulder, like watching over his shoulder. And as he said that, I was looking over my shoulder to, to check my blind spot to change lanes. And I was like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What's going on here? That was weird. And I'm like, okay, no big deal. But then, you know me, okay, I don't advise this, but I pulled my phone out and I was typing a status on Facebook that says, you ever feel like, you're exactly where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be, you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. And by the time, like, I'm not an idiot about doing this stuff on my phone. Like, I'm. it took me a minute to get it all the way done. So they were moving through their conversation. And by this point in time, they were talking a little bit about something else. And as soon as I went to push the button, that said post, Joe Rogan says, people just want to, and as I'm pushing it, post. <laughs> and I was like, I put my phone down. I was like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> like, stop. This is getting ridiculous. Like, I was literally like, all right, I hear you. Whoever's trying to say this to me, I hear you. I'm listening. And it was at that moment that I was just like, all right. Like, this is totally undeniable. Like that is not just a coincidence of things happening because it was too significant of like two moments in my life that were exactly what I was doing within a couple minutes of each other. And it just, that was where something, a switch flipped in my mind that said, this is life. This is the mechanism. Yep. There's this is the structure that that like what if it's a simulation, this is the freaking code behind the simulation. And and this is like this concept of paying attention to those moments and just living your life and paying attention to those signs saying, all right, you're doing the right thing. And and following that is how you do exactly what you're supposed to do in life and get to where you're supposed to. And I will add to this too, that I've had periods in life where these were missing. And, uh, yeah. And I consciously recognized it and then started to pick up on the small stuff again. And it was like I was tuning back into it and yep. full and literally we're to a point right now I got chills talking about this where it is so crazy that it's like happening more than ever. And, and real quick before I turn it back to you, I'll give mine that happened today. Yeah. So the Buckeye BMX show, Buckeye bike show happened 10 days ago today, Uh 10 days. So we're, we're not talking like, Oh, I just got the footage 
I just edited everything up. I'm posting it the next day and this is relevant and whatever. So this is 10 days later. My first video is going live from the event is the Eddie Fiola bike check. Word. I posted the video and I was going to post it on Facebook and I'm listening to the Dave Volker podcast that came out today from our BMX. And I'm typing in this thing I want to post on Facebook. And as I'm typing Eddie's name, Rooftop says Eddie Fiola for the first time in that podcast. And that was the moment of like for today that was just like, all right, <laughs> like you got me. Like, I, I guess this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm doing everything right. And I mean, it's almost like a confirmation of like what we're supposed to be doing this right now. I mean, even more so than what there already has been. Like we had, I haven't even told the Texas Roadhouse story yet. Frog bars knocks on the door as loudly as you need him to knock on the door. It's insane. <laughs> so like, can you tell me your first memory of like a situation that was more significant than just, Oh, I'm singing a song that was on the radio when I got in my car. There's one that comes to mind before we do it. Shout out to large Ray. He loves this shirt because he says it looks like a, like a Confederate soldier. Um, <laughs> it's not a pajama shirt. I promise. Um, but he, like he, Ray, I love Ray. He makes fun of me all day long. And I, I ask him to never stop. Um, so one, uh, okay. So before I was contract contracted by Lollapalooza, I was going to the different shows and wholesaling shrimp rocks to, to guys. Uh, and there was this one guy who, um, he's like, yeah, we're going to be at Star Lake Amphitheater in Pittsburgh and we're going to run out of stuff. And this was, I, I, I was contracted in 93 i was wholesaling the guys in 92 so i'd follow them around to restock them because the 92 show was like huge and everybody was selling out and so uh i was living my my parents had uh what was that i was i i was living on campus on osu campus my parents lived in um uh, like granville and it was the it was the summer and so I was like, look, um, my guy, I forget his name. I was like, my guy's uh, going to be at Star Lake Amphitheater, and I've been making stuff for the past however many weeks, and I'm going to sell it to him. And he goes, where's my, my father is a military guy. He goes, where's, where's Star Lake Amphitheater? I go, Pittsburgh. He goes, how are you going to get there? I'm going go to follow the signs to Pittsburgh. And he's like, no, this is 1992. Mm -hmm. They didn't have cell phones. And he's like, all right. And so I uh, followed the signs. To Pittsburgh and uh, going, 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 going. I'm like, eh, maybe I should pull over. So I pull over, I, I go to a uh, McDonald's and I walk up and the, the kid goes, can I take your order? And I go, hey, where's Star Lake Amphitheater? And he goes, it's one exit down. And I go, <laughs> that's fantastic. Stay right here. I don't know why I told the kid to stay right here because he was like, I'm going to be right back. <laughs> yeah. So I went out into the car. I got one of these crystals and I gave it to him. I said, look, I sell these. Thank you. I was looking for Starlight Camp for theater. And he's just like, whatever. So I go there. I unload just a ton of stuff. And it was such a fun day because I sold, I sold all my stuff. He needed more. I just sat there and made shrimp rocks next to the booth. And every so often I get like, I don't know, 50, a hundred pieces. And I just, sell it to him. So I came home with like 1200 bucks, which was super, it was super dope. Um, uh, but that was one, that was one example when I was like, yo, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be able to go out and do this thing. And, uh, I'm going to be able to find my way. Um, flatlanders know this. Uh, you can, you can tell if there's a dope spot behind like, like you can find a parking lot. You can, people were telling me stories about when they would go to, um, uh, what was Mala Turno's rampage mm -hmm. where they're just driving around and they're like, they would just drive around that part of 
Iowa. And they're like, this seems like this, this feels like it's going to be a spot. Like I have a friend who found the, who found rampage by driving around until it felt right. You want to hear a funny one with that real quick? I do. We were going to Louisville skate park and my, this was before smartphones were everywhere. And my buddy sponge didn't have a smartphone until like five or six years ago. He's like, I'm going to, he's like, I'm going to get there without a GPS. I'm going to go to Louisville skate park without a GPS. So I put it in my phone because I think I had a smartphone at the time from our hotel, like not all the way to Louisville, but we went, we, we made it to Louisville without all yeah. that. And we got our hotel and we're going to go from the hotel to Louisville skate park. So I put it in my phone. I'm like, all right, I'm not telling you go. <laughs> and he would go somewhere like, all right, what are we doing next? And we turn, turn, turn. And then literally it got to a point where I can't remember what he said. Part of me wants to I don't know if this is just me just like romanticizing it, but part of me wants to say that he was like, it's on the other side of that building. But, but I feel like what actually happened is that he got to a point where he was like, all right, like, where do I go? And then it was like, dude, you're like literally two turns and you're there. Like we're within a half mile of this place maybe maybe less than that and it was literally he did it without a gps he just did it by how it felt i guess uh brian huffman finds flatland spots like that yeah. it, it uh it, it's like this it's like the sixth sense that you have that, like you're coming up on the right spot and some of it is like you can tell you can you can see like little clues like what's you, you get a sense of where the dope loading dock is going to be. Cause it, oh, yeah. like I used, I used to ride street. I don't have street instincts anymore. Mm-hmm. I barely, I barely ride outside anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm a little bit like a domesticated cat on that front. <laughs> like, That's okay. I, I don't, I don't know that I could find um, a dope organic uh, flatland spot. I, I, I make my flatland spots now. Um, yeah. So it's like, if you follow your gut and keep following your gut and you do that for years and then you get real reinforcement from it, it builds your confidence. Oh, yeah. It builds your confidence for sure. And, you know, you cannot help but get better at something that you do repeatedly for years with confidence. Mm-hmm. Like you can, the, the way I describe it, to, um, so I'm, I'm working on this part of the, 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 the trick that um, it's just the takeoff jump. It's a no handed jump. Yeah. And it's just the takeoff. But uh, I am tuning that now. It, like it happens in a fraction of a second. And so all of the biomechanics, which is like, like how I jump, all of that, I'm like revisiting over and over and over. And I'm, it's like I see it in bullet time. Um, and whenever you study something really, really intensely, and in this case, of course, it's BMX trick, you can you you can describe like moment to moment, like your ankles have to engage, then mm. your knees have to engage, and there's the toe thing, and um, you just intimately understand uh, a maneuver, a, a movement more and more deeply, and yeah, it becomes like Neo in the Matrix with bullet time. Yeah, you you cannot help but uh, comprehend it uh, to that level of precision. You you because you're just doing it repeatedly in your mind. You cannot help but do it. But once you're in there, it's like holy smokes! I'm spending so much of my effort and attention to uh, a part of a trick that happens in some second. Yeah. And weird things happen in that world. Oh, yeah. And it's crazy whenever you talk to people and they say, like, oh, I quit trying after 10 tries. Because my concept of that is that I don't quit trying until I land it. <laughs> Period. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's funny you should say that. So in, uh, in 2021, I, I moved into... The Terra home, which is 
renovated schoolhouse between two farm fields about 60 miles from Dave Chappelle. Mm-hmm. And uh, Marty, my coach, Marty Copa, said, what are we going to work on this year? And I said, you know, I thought about it. I'm, I'm going to work on the thing that I was most afraid of, which was whiplashes. I had never done whiplashes. Um, but when I had tried to do whiplashes, like multiple whiplashes in the past, I would spend like, I don't know, 30 minutes on it and you just can't do it. And so I committed to Marty that I would not stop until I got to 10 whiplashes and I would do nothing else. And what I said was the only way to do this is to burn the boats. Have you ever heard that expression, burn the boats? Mm -mm. Okay, so this is like a conquistador thing. They land in the new world and the generals burned the boats uh, because they did not want, they didn't want to give their soldiers any option. Mm. <laughs> you either you either win oh, or you don't win, but you cannot yeah. retreat. And so I, as Marty is my accountability coach, I said, burn the boats. And um tremendous things happen when you actually burn the boats that's interesting <laughs> yeah i i don't i don't advocate burning other people's boats <laughs> I, yeah. I i advocate burning your own boats uh when you really have to dig deep to pull something off and when i did i mean oh it was it was not comfortable learning to ride w- with, with with my right leg but i had to learn how to do it in order to get the whiplash now i can do it um but that was like super deep now it wasn't exactly frog bars yeah uh but it was i would say uh instructive of the level of commitment and so like how does this go back to frog bars um frog bars is not the easiest thing to learn it is learnable it doesn't it's it it doesn't require pain to learn Mm -hmm. but it requires lots of little confirmations lots of little trials which is why i suggest starting with something like understanding 43 and just looking for it Mm -hmm. to let the system or to let the thing prove itself to you and then it becomes much easier because the last thing you want to do is ascribe frog bars to something that is not frog bars because then you're going to be like practicing wrong yeah which perfect example of that i have to i think i have to tell one story to get to another story Uh uh-huh uh the perfect example of that is the texas roadhouse one for people's Mm. reference to know what i'm talking about but before that us even meeting and being in the same place came from a situation that was an example of this because ray and i were to do the podcast about the Dave Mira memorabilia. I can't say that word, but we were supposed to do this podcast because he posted on Facebook about all this stuff. And I think he mentioned he was going to take it to that Buckeye bike show. And then Stoney was like, dude, like you are the dude, you need to do a podcast about this. Talk about all this stuff. And to be totally honest, I was like, I don't even know what we'll say about it. Like, were we going to show it? And that's just it. Like, I don't know. But I'm like, yeah, dude, I'm down. I don't care. This is going to be cool. He was the guy from made like the coach on the MTV's made like, hell yeah. I want to talk to him. So sometimes we try to plan it out and it's just like a little bit of time passes. It didn't happen overnight that we planned. It It wasn't like, here's this idea. We're going to do it next week. And this is it. It was, here's this idea. Yeah, let's do it. Time goes by for a little bit. All right, now when are we going to do it? All right, let's do it next Tuesday. Turns out next Tuesday to do our podcast about Dave Mira memorabilia is Dave Mira's birthday. And then during that podcast, it was like, dude, like you're in Ohio. Everybody's going there. You were in the comments during the live thing. And it was just like immediately during all that I had to commit. And it's just it has to happen. And so it did. And then within 30 seconds of us meeting in person, I I put it in my Instagram post. It was like I met a long lost lifelong research partner that I didn't even know I had within the first 30 seconds because we're both just like we're already on the same and we're going to get to frequency in a bit yeah but we were already on the same frequency to the point where it was like we see each other we start talking and we're just like yep 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 you get it yep (laughs) 
and then it it was crazy. So like us just meeting for the first time came from an example of this. And it wasn't even one that was like the whole sign from the universe that you follow kind of thing. It was one that just the, that's one that feels like serendipity because it just like happened. It just happened that way. And it was like, whoa, this is kind of crazy. And so the one that I wanted to get to with the Texas Roadhouse thing and like false signals, as you could say, was uh-huh. we we were going to go to the Mexican restaurant. We were walking from the hotel. Then I see Texas Roadhouse. I'm like, oh, there's a Texas Roadhouse. And Ray's like, you want to go to Texas Roadhouse? I'm like, I mean, I don't want to tell everybody where to go. And he's like, no, really, you want to go to I'm like, I'm like, I guess. And he's like, all right, we're going to Texas Roadhouse. So we, we walk over and then <laughs> on our way, I'm like, I'm realizing, like, man, every time I've gone here, we have to have like a two hour wait to even get in. And then we walk in the door and we're like, oh, yeah, there could be a long wait here. And we're all like, do we really want to wait a long time? Then the lady's like, oh, it'll be 20 minutes. And we're like, oh, sick. And so we're sitting there. And then not even 20 minutes had gone by. It was probably like, it's like 10. five minutes, five, yeah. 10 minutes. Huh? They're like, all right, your table, whatever. And so Rodney was like, is this, is this frog bars, Brent? Like, does this qualify? And I was like, I literally was like, no, no, I don't think this is significant enough to qualify for that. Like, just, it's not, it's not quite there, you know? And so I'm like, just give it a bit. Just, just wait, it'll happen. (laughs) And, And so we're in this meal talking about this podcast and and you and our, cause we'd mentioned it all day we're talking about how it's gonna happen it's gonna happen <laughs> and then we're finally like all right when are we gonna do this and i was like i can't do it next week and i didn't say anything beyond that i just said uh-huh. i can't do it next week and you're like yeah i can't either i've got a trip to chicago tuesday through thursday and i was like what <laughs> i was like hold on a minute you got what <laughs> because this is the part that is is that i had a trip a work trip to Chicago area <laughs> Tuesday through Thursday where we were in the, we couldn't do it because we were both traveling for work to the <laughs> same area of the country on the same days of the week. I think we're in a state of quantum entanglement now. <laughs> we were already there, bud. <laughs> It was already gonna happen because it's so dope and it blows my freaking mind. Like we can tell the story later, but I mean, this concept that we're talking to and paying attention to it as Mm -hmm. silly as it were with the situation that has to do with the story is it's what led to the dominoes and the butterfly flapping its wings that got me onto S and M and fit. I told you this story uh, yes. and I don't know if I told I it on the story. podcast or not, but I adore this. like, I don't know when we want to tell this one. I don't know. Can, can... I want, I want to hear it right now. All right. <laughs> that, are you, after can that, you tell it again. Yes. Okay. After that, I want you to tell me your most significant story of like, of this, like the most significant example in your life of this. I want to hear after this. Sure. 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 Okay. So, to start all of this up, like how I got onto s and yes, there were a bunch of factors and I'm going to give the disclaimer ahead of time. Like, yes, I've been working my ass off, riding my bike, making videos and helping people on YouTube for a very long time. Like, obviously the situation I'm going to say and the story I'm going to tell is not what got me there. It's the sequence of events that led to it actually happening. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) to tell this story, I have to start by saying how Montana Ricky did his podcast with Dustin, just whatever his Instagram. Oh my God. Uh, And Ricky got a job finally. Yes. But that was such an insane podcast and it's so funny. And Ricky disappeared. 
after that like, for six months and i'm really happy that he's on instagram he's got a job at fiend and now like yes. things got really bad for a second i'm happy that he's came out on the other side but during this podcast they made a comment about chris doyle ricky made uh, a comment about chris doyle and how he whatever comment doesn't even matter but that is the original thing that like led to whatever to so that happens the internet gets put on fire like yeah. everyone got their pitchforks and torches out <laughs> and went after montana ricky and yep. so after he that could happened, have said it differently yeah he really I mean, could have should have said it differently but continue I'm yes sorry. as a disclaimer but <laughs> yes but that happened and i hit doyle up saying like hey do you want to do a podcast and like maybe not talk about that but just do yeah. a podcast because give respect just in general like i wanted to do one with him and like maybe we don't talk about this and during the time period of us like trying to figure out when we were going to do this uh bmx legend in ohio ray Faircloud passed away and doyle so actually another example of frog bars comes up in this in that I was uh, driving, Victoria and I were either going out to dinner or going to a movie, and we were talking about Doyle, and he calls me. Well, we were, like, right when we started talking about him. And I can't remember the exact sequence of events, but at some point in time, it might have even been after all of this, but at some point in time, Doyle and I ended up on the phone after everything happened with Ray, and we talked about how that happening made us realize like what actually matters in life. You know, uh, when you see somebody yeah. you're friends with and that happens to you, really yeah. just it grounds you to like this Internet story, this thing that happened, everybody being mad. Literally none of it matters. Both yep. of I, both of us were on the same page with that. We were like, so we were originally going to address the montana ricky thing a little bit and then during that conversation we were both like man let's just not even talk about it yeah just yeah because it's like it's it's just not important it doesn't yeah. matter and then so the day of our podcast comes around this is where it gets silly and this is where me and false signals that ended up not actually being false signals come in is that, Ooh. yeah, it's kind of crazy when you wrap your head around all of it. But I'm on my way up to Ray's, listening to a podcast. And this is where it's kind of silly. <laughs> like, whatever. But I'm driving and they're talking. They immediately, like, not immediately. They brought up Skunks. And that's another JRE podcast. He's a prominent theme in my frog bars but he's like skunks are effective and as he's saying that i look down and i'm driving by a roadkill skunk in the road and my dumb ass this is this was there was two of them it was him calling me so that's what it was he called me as i was talking about or something that was one example and then the next example was the skunk thing and my dumbass brings this up in a podcast talking to Chris Doyle on my YouTube channel. Like, he does not want to hear about this because he and I, yeah. Can I just laugh at you saying he does not want to hear about this? I, I mean, does he? Does he? But the reason I brought it up with him was because when he called me while I was talking about him, we talked about the universe for a second and i was like this is just kind of how i live my life these moments where it feels like things align and so i thought like oh yeah i'll bring it up that that happened during our podcast so how does that have anything to do with us podcast comes out and chris moeller screen records that part of the podcast and records himself with a mug Drinking from his mug as if he's drinking and he's part of the podcast. Like he and he puts himself in Doyle's position and and is just like he's like making faces like hmm. You know, like 
the skunks. Hmm. And he, <laughs> he posts this on his Instagram with the caption, like, had a great time on Brant Moore's podcast. <laughs> and, and so people saw it and was like, oh my God, when's that coming out? Because <laughs> they thought it was real. And I replied to it in a message to him with just crying, laughing faces. Because I thought it was hilarious. Like, this is the funniest thing ever. Like, yes, of course, you're poking fun. But I think it's funny at the same time. And so he immediately was like, I meant no offense by this. Like, I'm sorry if you're offended, whatever. But I would actually be honored to be on your podcast. So I was like, let's do it. Immediately. So dope. Let's do it. And so that podcast and him saying, like, he said so many nice things about what I'm doing in that podcast and just gave me so much high praise that it made me immediately make the decision, like, I'm going to ride an S&M, even if I have to buy it. Yeah. And before that, I was of the Mm -hmm. mindset that, like, I'm riding a Sunday sound wave until they stop making Sunday sound waves period because that's just that's the one i don't care if i never ride for sunday i never officially rode for sunday or was affiliated with them officially in any per any capacity and that podcast was enough that i was like all right this is happening even if i have to pay full price for this frame i don't care i'm because he supported me and and this is the thing is like at swamp fest two years before this even maybe even three he walked through a group of people up to me put his hand out and he's like i gotta meet this guy and i'm like who the hell is he talking about and then he walks up to me puts his hand out and was like you're my favorite person on the internet wow so like and before that he he posted like a picture of my news video on a screen so he's like, this was a year before that. So it's like, there is a history here. And then he says all of this stuff to where it's like, this dude has supported and likes what I do and has been psyched on it for so long. Like, why, how could I not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then, you know, I'm, I'm friends with Charlie Crumler. So I hit him up. And I'm like, dude, like, I really want to try and make this happen. And so he helped start the conversation there and and kept he kind of facilitated like that part of it and then holy shit there's more (laughs) but that is the story of how like me taking this stupid insignificant oh they're talking about skunks and i drive by a skunk (laughs) and it all started from skunks (laughs) like dude how ridiculous that was the rabbit hole yeah so (laughs) so that's how that concept led to me being on sm and then another example of it that came up in the whole process of that is i didn't care about frame color in all this like i get on the phone with melissa and i talk to her like the btm frame that snm makes is not only my initials but also almost exactly the same geometry as the sound wave the rear end is like the tiniest bit shorter and the standover is a quarter inch difference which doesn't affect the way your bike feels the rear end is a little bit but it's almost the same and it's my initials so i'm like and this is happening i don't care what color this frame is like the fact this is even happening is enough for me so i send a text later in the day like we talk on the phone I send my parts list. They want to send it out that day. And I'm like, oh, crap, I forgot about color. Like, hey, can you just tell me, like, what my options are? And she texts me back and is like, "Uh, there's a trans teal and a trans orange that are coming soon, but I don't know when. And me, like, I've always rode green frames. It's just what I like. And I like the color green. So I was like, this trans teal was like, it's my color. And so I'm like, yes, that's awesome. I want that. And then she texts me back in a couple minutes. And I was like, because I, I have to go back a little bit. I forgot something. The original part of the conversation was that she asked me if there was a fit frame that had geometry that I would like. So I explained the significance of the BTM and like 
hey, it's my initials. It's already almost the exact geometry that I would want. So, like, can we do that one? She said, oh, of course. Like, I'm like, I mean, it kind of, you know, it was meant to be at this point. And, yeah. and then she texts me a couple minutes after I say, I want this frame color, saying, wow, it must really be meant to be that frames came back from paint 10 minutes ago. No. <laughs> So they sent my stuff out <laughs> either that even like that day or the next morning and it all just worked and happened perfectly like it was meant to be. So that's the S&M story. That's awesome. It's crazy, that's awesome. right? It's totally crazy. It's totally crazy. It's it's one it's a situation that is not coincidence at that point. It can't be. Uh it would be if you, if you added up the probabilities of all of those things, it becomes very low probability. Oh yeah. So like if you like if you have two things that are linked and each are fifty percent probability, mm -hmm. you don't add them. You don't add them together. Uh, a, a chain of probabilities is multiplicative, which is fifty percent of fifty oh, yeah. percent is twenty five percent. So the more you chain together. Uh, the, the lower the probability and so you, you there, there are a lot of things that came together that were already low probability and when they chained together super low probability and then it popped that's quite quite far from random like you would not buy a lottery ticket given those odds you would hold on a second you would not spend a thousand dollars on a lottery ticket with those odds <clears throat> it would it would not be rational but it, it, it you you lived it and it came through that is a very low probability to happen by chance and it all just comes from paying attention to those those moments and oh i might have been too sensitive in the moment of driving by a skunk and joe rogan saying skunks are effective <laughs> like what <laughs> and, and i'm like talking about that with chris doyle like and then it leads to all of this stuff so i mean yeah it's crazy what's your it I got a couple things that I want to share with you. Um, one, uh, I was when I was born in Cleveland. Uh, I lived on West Ninety Eighth, mm -hmm. which is down the street from Waldorf, which is down the street from where my grandfather had his machine shop for like fifty years. And I made pegs. Uh, he moved out, and that is now the site of Ray's Mountain Bike oh, Park. Of and there is, it is. A, and there is a room in the back that smells like methyl ethyl ketone which is the solvent my grandfather used. And I recognize that smell because I grew up with it and the smell still exists in Ray's. It's pretty dope. Um, Ray, uh, I'll tell you a story about Raybo that happened. We went to Buckeye Bike Show. We're sitting in the hotel parking lot and a dude walks by. There has been a dude named Dave who's walked by, Dave, by Ray's. Oh my God, yeah. He, he's walked by Ray's house for 13 years. In where? Ray comes to Ohio, in, in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. Ray drives to the Buckeye Bike Show in Dayton, Ohio. And Dave from King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, walks by Ray again. <laughs> was it morning? It was, it was, uh, I don't know. When I, I got there, I got there after work. So it was evening, probably 6 Oh, you mean like how he said that the guy walked by at this time in the morning and this time in the afternoon? Evening? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. And it happened at the same. It happened at the same time. We had a long conversation with who we call New Dave. Um, <clears throat> oh, so okay. So here's a here's a story that has stuck uh, with me for for quite some time. Um, so I so I told you how I drove to Starlight Amphitheater to sell all of the shrimp rocks and make a bunch of money. Well, I was at that point I was I was rich, and I I went to a, a guy who had a shop on the corner of Chittenden and High. He went by the name of Crazy Andy. He he didn't he didn't give himself that name. We all gave himself that name. He was this hippie, and I used to buy crystal from him. Mm -hmm. And he was like, "Look, I, I could sell you a hundred pounds of crystal at, at five bucks a pound." And uh, I went over, I, I picked it all out, and he was telling me where he got it from. And he was mining. He was mining at Coleman Mine uh, in Arkansas. And I was like, that's pretty dope. I'd like to go there. I ended up buying like a $300 car from him, which was because I was rich, of course. 
And um, it was a 1973 Grand Torino, like the Starsky and Hutch. Uh, and I was super stoked on the car. And I, I, I called my father and I said, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to Arkansas. I'm going to mine Crystal and I'm going to drive my new car down there. Now, this car was a piece of shit <laughs> and it, had, it, it, it leaked gas. And so my father goes, hold on a second. Um, I'm going to grab your grandfather and we're going to, uh, we're going to, we're going to head down. So the three of us used to go on <clears throat> hunting trips, fishing trips, stuff like that. It'd been a long time since we had done it. My grandfather and I were, were such buddies. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, my dad bo- borrows his buddy's, uh, like camper trailer thing and we're towing it down. We're heading to Arkansas. We have a little bit better directions this time. Uh, but my grandfather's telling a story about his, uh, his daughter's father-in-law hears that we're going to Arkansas. And he goes, Hey, when you get to Arkansas, look up my friend Art Bates. And so we laughed about that for the whole trip down, busting this old man's balls because he says, go to see my friend Art Bates. We're like, whatever. So we, we roll up, we find Coleman Mine, and uh, I get there, and it's like a tourist trap, and I'm mm-hmm. just, like, sick to my stomach. <clears throat> and it was up this, because it was a, a mine, so you had to kind of, like, hairpin turn up it. Uh, so we turn back down, and we're like, man, we're screwed. What are we going to do? There's a campground at the at the end of the, it's at, at like the bottom of the hill and uh my uh we, we pull up my dad puts the the, the van in, in park and he, he looks at, at me and my grandfather and he goes let me do the talking you guys stay here comes out now my grandfather and i were very similar in our uh in the way we navigated uh a weird world which was do it by gut work with people find the good ones whatever my father a little bit more cynical um, he kind of rebelled from my grandfather, which made a very interesting dynamic because to my, in, to my father's view, the things that drove him bananas about the free spiritedness of his father, he had in his son. And so when the three of us got together, he was like, oh, I got these two wing mm-hmm. nuts. Anyway, so he's yapping, 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 yapping. And he, he, he gets back in the car and he goes, uh, they got one more spot. Uh, we can have it. And he asked me, where are you boys from? And he goes, Cleveland. And he goes, do you know my friend Bill Cordrick? And he goes, <laughs> are you Art Bates? And he goes, uh-huh. <laughs> I knew this was going here. What yeah. the hell? Frog bars, bro. Frog bars. That's, Frog bars. That's, yeah. And I, I, and I was taking my family, uh, I was taking my dad and my grandfather to mine crystal that, uh, t- uh, uh, m- much of which I still have today and much of which is in the uh, shrimp rocks that I, uh, that I, that I, that I made. Um, yeah, that was, that, I, that, that is such a fun story. And uh, my father is the one who had to get the critical pieces of the puzzle, which I thought was spectacular because frog bars will work even if you are skeptical of frog bars. It doesn't matter. Uh, It doesn't matter. Once you're surrounded by frog bars and once you have people in your crew who are down with frog bars, you will have an experience of frog bars that you cannot get out of your head. Warren Marchese hated every time we talked about the Stoke. Yeah. He hated everything every time we talked about shrimp rocks. He hated everything about frog bars. Uh, when we went to the BMX Hall of Fame for the induction of Kevin Jones, he took Ray's shrimp rock and wore it all week. And he gave it um, to Tara Lane's partner, uh, who took it back? Uh, I think I live in Canada. I know she was Canadian. Anyway, the other day, Warren made a reference about frog bars, and Warren is very pragmatic. He doesn't like to play with fantasy stuff. He has no no time for the nonsense, and I don't blame him. 
and he's a good father uh and uh, he has seen the light now I, I don't know if if he has had the visitation from frog bars and so i gave i i i i selected for ray a shrimp rock uh and i wrote down i wrote down what i believed frog bars message to ray would be and so kind of like that uh that johnny carson bit with karnak when ray does in fact reveal the frog bars dream and ray does in fact write down what frog bar says we're going to have a show where i open my sealed letter and ray opens his sealed letter and we're going to see and if those things match that's irrefutable then 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 Ray's going to be on TV again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seriously. Because that's going to be another show. And I told Ray about like my scheme. <clears throat> and I think I think I said this on Factor Freestyle. I was like, let me get this out of the way. If we collude and like make this, like if we collude and pretend that it happened, then it will ruin the whole thing. And I have no desire to fake it. Uh, and so uh, if it happens, it will be absolutely authentic and that you know along the way of uh having these frog bars experiences i came to a new appreciation of the importance of telling the truth and here's why um think of the most disingenuous bullshitty writer you've ever known don't say his name uh but that's the guy who said oh i did you know i i did a I, I you know I, I invented triple mm -hmm. triple bar spins right um don't believe that sh shit yeah right now they're gonna lie uh so that they get the accolades for doing something that they didn't put the work in to do um the reason the reason to tell the truth all the time is so that when the inevitability of some amazing experience happens to you, People that the experience, that the, that, that, that the ability to have, that the possibility of having such an experience is believed. And so as an example, if Todd Carter were to have a visitation from frog bars, then the world would know about the visitation from frog bars mm -hmm. because Todd Carter doesn't lie. Yeah. Does not lie. And everybody knows that Todd Carter doesn't lie. That's what's so important about not lying is uh, now it's going to be a pain in the ass. Uh, you're going to have to admit some stupid shit that you did. Uh, you're going to have to take it on the chin. It's going to be embarrassing. You're going to have to say, no, I made the wrong decision. It's totally stupid right now. I see it right now. But if you, if you try to lie your way out of situations, first off, just trying to keep up with the direction of the lie is awful but something is going to happen to you that will be lost and humanity will not, uh, will not be able to experience it because you will have been untrustworthy. And that is like detrimental to everyone on earth when one person lies and, or, or what, what, when one person has uh, a history of lying, not, none of the spectacular things that will inevitably, inevitably happen to them will be believable. And sense. so, yeah, and so one of the things that happened along the way, and it, this wasn't a recent thing. This happened, um, I forget how many years ago, but it's been a while uh, that I just, I will not lie. I will not lie. Uh, my stories are ridiculous. Ray loves these stories. In fact, he, he, Ray, has, Ray has asked me to send him periodic updates throughout the day when I do weird things. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, don't lie because uh, frog bars is 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 gonna come. Frog bar, frog bars is gonna pay you a visit, and your friends need to be able to believe um, your frog bars visitation. So that's public service announcement. Don't lie. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's it's interesting that you bring all of that up too. I mean, I I'm definitely a very upfront straight up blunt not gonna lie to you kind of person uh i wanted to talk about red pilling people <laughs> because that's effectively what you were talking a little bit about 
Yes. And I guess before we even go there, I I kind of want to also say that like the things we're talking about are not absolutes. Like okay. Like I don't know how I want to say it. I kind of lost. I I lost how I was going to say it. I'll wait. Just start talking. No, I'll wait. Start talking. I'll wait. Okay. We'll red pill people first. <laughs> no, but that's kind of awesome. like what I started calling it whenever I told people about all of this. And yeah. instead of trying to define it in talking about like what it is to people, I just tell people the, the original story when I was yeah, driving. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, that is what I'm talking about and just paying attention to the small signs and following those types of things. But the one example that I have of this one, that's pretty funny is that I have a friend who was thinking about quitting their job and pursuing something that some people might call as crazy. Like mm-hmm. I thought it was totally made sense. And the person was in a perfect position to do this, but naturally this person was worried about certain things. And so our conversation in this moment that led to me talking about all this stuff started with an Instagram story that I posted saying a quote from a professor that I had in college. It was just, it's very simple. It's just luck favors the prepared one. Yeah. Which is a yeah. really, really good quote because it's absolutely yeah. true. Like if you, bring jumper cables and your car breaks down. Oh, it's lucky I had jumper cables. No, you were prepared for that situation. It's not necessarily lucky. And if you think about life in that context, you can be prepared and be lucky in most situations. But I posted that and this person replied to me talking about how, oh, I don't really believe in luck. Uh, Luck, I don't know. I just don't believe in luck. And so we just kind of went on this whole thing. Like I just defined what luck favors the prepared one means. It doesn't mean like, oh, this random situation occurred and you were lucky. Oh, you just happened to win 10 grand for something like, no, it's you being prepared for things that makes you feel, oh, it's lucky in this situation. And so it was like, oh yeah, understand now we like get where each other's coming from. But then we started talking about this job thing and how this person is worried about finance because naturally if you're, you're changing careers and changing what you're doing in life to support yourself, you're going to be worried about finance. Mm -hmm. So that's how the conversation kind of started. And we talked about the universe stuff and I'm like, I just kind of pay attention to things and go with the flow. And it feels like life works out for me better that way. And So I get a message the next day. This person got an email from a client. The company of the client was Lucky Financial. (laughs) You know, when you think about this stuff, when you like, when it, when it, when it's on your mind, uh, and maybe it's, uh, maybe you're maybe you're hoping for something. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe you're uh, well. Anyone who's ever skied through trees will tell you, "Don't look at the trees." Oh, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I fell. I fell off the same chairlift uh, uh, twenty years apart, and the second time I did it, it was because I was I had been thinking about it all day, and it happened the exact same way. Yeah, the exact same way. Uh, now I didn't attribute that to frog bars. I was like, "Wow, what are the chances that I can fall off the same chairlift twenty years apart in the exact same way?" Mm. So then I was like, "Could I do that intentionally about stuff I want to have happen?" Yeah, and uh, I got a little boost from that for sure. For sure. Yeah. And like, like, you know, when um, people will say, uh, I want to, I want to, I want to pursue my uh, dream, 
but I don't want to sacrifice my job or I don't want to give up my salary to pursue my dream. Yeah. Um, you know, the other way to look at that is would you take a job knowing that it would kill your dream? Right. Exact same uh, algebra, but if you switch the variables, um, it it can help you understand the consequences of one decision versus another. I mean, these are just very simple little mind games, and uh, if. If, if you've heard of the mind game at least once, you can reuse the mind game over and over and over. And I, I think it's, uh, of these little mind game tricks that I can play with myself, play, <laughs> that, that I can <laughs> There's play. There's no editing. <laughs> uh, ah, no, you're good. No, all right. You're good. Stoney's going to fix that real good. Um, but if you can play these mind games, uh, with your own mind, and you can do so intentionally, uh, you can uh, uh, you 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 can guide your emotions in a way that will be supportive of your ultimate goal. So, do I want to give up my job to pursue my dream? Uh, are 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 you going to take a job knowing that it will kill your dream? Right. And hopefully the answer is no, I will not take a job that would kill my dream. Like you should not walk away from your dreams. And um, it, it, uh, you absolutely will have to work hard to uh, to continue to pursue your dreams. But if your dreams are dope, like you're going to work on that. Like mm -hmm. If you want to do a trick, you're going to keep working on that. It's not going to happen. All at once. That's what I love about BMXers is, uh, you know, we, we, like we celebrate people who just crush it. Um, but you know damn well. All right, so like Garrett Reynolds, mm -hmm. like the level of precision in everything he puts out is like astounding, and everything he does is so clean that he does on film. But the amount of technical practice that has to go into that is like next next level anyone yeah. in bmx knows that you can get to that point uh, by wanting it enough that you're doing it over and over and over and over and over and over mm -hmm. um it is the same thing with with your dreams and absolutely. it's totally possible absolutely yeah and so to talk more about red pilling i mean oh yes let's red pill that yes. is, we're red pilling right now the whole purpose <laughs> of this podcast is to red pill people into like just becoming aware and i think just yes. being aware of this and even reasonably believing that it could be possible isn't yeah it's yeah. because yeah. i've i've done this to multiple people <clears throat> and like it's funny that several of them have had these crazy things like, oh, wow. And then it's just like, oh, I just I feel a little bit better about what I'm doing because it feels like it's what I'm supposed yes. to do in life. And yeah, and it's good that way. Yeah, it's uh, you should you, Brant, should feel very good about uh, uh the experiences you've had that you are sharing with people uh, because you are accelerating uh, their uh, their journey to, to get where they, they want to go. And, and you know this, if you're figuring this stuff out on your own, uh, it's, it's scary. It takes a long time. Uh, and you do make some mistakes. When you look back and you could say, not that, hey, I wish I had a book that told me everything, but I'm grateful for whatever little bits of confidence I got along the way. And I'm grateful for the little bits of clues that I picked up 
along the way. Uh, you are laying breadcrumbs right now for people to pick up uh, and they're going to pick up the ones that they're comfortable with, but you're laying the breadcrumbs and mm -hmm. you're, you're laying them all over. And um, yeah, you should feel super stoked about that. And uh, people who find your breadcrumbs who get closer to uh, being red pilled uh, should be super grateful. And then they should go and do the same thing as lay down the breadcrumbs. Yeah. I yeah. Mean so what blows my mind in some of this stuff and what kind of blew my mind when we first talked about this at the, mm -hmm. the bike show was how you kind of told me that this is like a concept that is not new like this is something people have talked about before like we aren't we didn't invent it yeah we didn't invent it um we found it we validated it we put it into uh, our own words and we put it into the words that the people around us are using. So one of the things that I've noticed along the way is like everybody has, we all speak English, but we actually do speak very different languages, mm -hmm. like very different languages. And, um, some of that is, is cultural. Some, some of that is like from someone's frame of reference. And so like if people will speak in passive voice or they'll say you, or they'll say I, like they'll actually change the subject of the sentence um, that, that they're using. So like, uh, I deal with this a lot as an analyst because I'm interviewing people all the time. Mm -hmm. I have to figure out like, what is the frame of reference, reference they're coming from? Anyway, in the stuff that you and I are talking about, um, there is no language to communicate this. Mm, yeah. That forces people to put it in their own language. And so everybody's speaking, it's like a big tower of Babel, but you, it, it is a skill that you can develop to uh, figure out what someone is hinting at, even if they're using words and then putting precision into those words so that somebody else can, uh, uh, can 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 put it to use as a um i'm i'm a writer uh but i i as a job i write research uh and i present and i do speeches and stuff like that and uh writing uh if if you can study something and put it into words that other people can read and figure out uh yeah more power to you ray roasts me all the time as i like tell him stuff and he'll just turn to todd and he's like what the hell is joe talking about <laughs> i feel like finding I'm, words is hard it is i feel like i'm really lucky that i've kind of done the things that i've done because i before I even started to do the types of videos I do on my YouTube channel now, and I had a job at a factory making training videos. And so oh. I had like, I through being a BMX rider, you already kind of have an analytical mindset where you're like, what did I do wrong in this process? How do I change yeah. it? Whatever. But before that, I didn't really have a, what's the word I want to use? Sequential approach to that yeah. mindset i mean sort of where you look at tricks and you think of it sequentially but like doing these training videos you really have to be analytical and sequential and because these are training videos for a process that if done wrong can literally kill people yeah it was very important that we made sure these things were right and through doing that for several years i just developed an even more analytical approach oh, to these things oh so keep going with it that like I made my own YouTube channel and I just, you know, stumbled upon realizing like, oh, if I make tips and tricks videos, like this is, could be a great way to make more videos and teach people things and whatever. And so I transferred that analytical approach to videos to, oh, they're for my, it's my own thing. And I think that that's what led to me making like the best possible tutorial videos that I could. And 
I think that analytical mindset is what allows me to articulate this concept in yep. a way that I think people can understand. And just that I explain the experience because there's no better way to learn something than the experience of it. Yeah. And I explain, and I don't explain something dumb like skunks. I explain an undeniable event, a sequence of events like the podcast I was listening to that literally described what I was doing in that exact moment in time, several times on a very significant day for me. So it's like, I, I feel like I'm lucky that I had things happen. And then it's like, sometimes it feels like, man, is that just all, is that coincidence that everything happens the way that it does? And then you find this thing and you're like, okay, so nothing feels like coincidence anymore. And there's something I really wanted to talk about, too. Once again, let's bring up the JRE. <laughs> but it makes sense. And I feel it's because I like, dude, I'm 100,000 percent sure that he's just in tune with this same stuff, too. When he talks about these things, you just get it. So the other day I was listening to one of these and he's talking about how he kind of noticed that there was a point where he just kind of felt like he was firing on all cylinders he's at a hundred percent everything is just good and he kind of he described it as he was on a certain frequency and then he talked about how he just kind of honed in on that and he realized maybe this frequency is something that i can replicate and do mm -hmm. anytime i want mm -hmm. and when he said that i was just kind of like boom, bounced it off of the whole concept that we are calling frog bars. And I'm like, all right, maybe there's something to this being frequency and that you're paying attention to the science from the universe and, and whatever else is, is being on that frequency that you need to be on to follow the path of whatever you're meant for. Like this is where the religion concept of it can come mm -hmm. in where it really does feel religious. And, and some of the stuff is like, I mean, you could only explain it through, you know, like it, it feels like True it's a story. religious experience. That's crazy. Yeah. So, so the frequency is the thing. And what is frequency? How do you describe at its core what a frequency is? What is it? Uh, the way I understand it is you'll have a sound wave. That's and it. And the, the frequency is the, uh, the amount of peaks that occur within a unit of time. And so mm -hmm. a frequency is like hertz, which is like megahertz or gigahertz, which is how many of peaks in between. Uh, yeah, that's how I understand uh, frequency, which is you how many it. how many peaks within a unit of time. Somebody also said vibrational energy. Great. So this mm -hmm. is this whole conversation is leading to this point here. Frequency ups and downs. Remember how you're talking mm -hmm. about tricks and mm -hmm. and then starting over with your thing. That's yeah. that's frequency. You're you're going to the top. And then you're going to the bottom, you're going to the top, you're going to the bottom. It's it's all frequency. Whenever I made my purgatory edit, I caught on to this concept of frequency in riding and where you, you go, whichever one you want to call being closer and further away from the trick, you go from, mm -hmm. we'll call it the top. So you're getting closer and closer and closer to it and you peak out at the top. Mm -hmm. and, and then you go further and further away from it. And it's a cycle of frequency and I called that purgatory because when you're in that, you're in that gap of time between idea and first trying a trick and landing the trick, you're in this frequency going up yeah. and down and it's, and it's purgatory. And I feel like all of this might have something to do with like the f getting tuned into different frequencies where you're, you're going this way you're going that way and and following the signs from the universe is how you're tuning that dial to get honed in and dialed in on whatever this frequency is i mean to to finish that thought i 
you were you and I were texting earlier this morning and I was telling you I was writing my notes and I was like, dude, I feel like I'm firing at 200 percent. It was literally I was in that frequency at that moment in time. And what was funny about it was that I kind of fell out of it and it was like it became fragmented and it was like, oh, where to go? I'm, I got to find it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at the beginning of this podcast, which is almost two hours ago at this point, I was not on the frequency I, I I mean I was here and we were we were doing good with it, but now I'm honed in on the frequency of things where it feels like my brain is firing and and so I swear that that it feels like that is part of it and to lend to this even further, there's two things with this and I want to get to another one at, way later, but the the song that I put on uh-huh. our reel that I posted was called synchronicity. And then the thing was 1111 uh, Hertz or whatever, uh, whatever it was. And I was like, Whoa. So like, clearly this is a thing already. This frequency, oh, yeah. people must believe that the, that the 1111 Hertz or whatever exactly it was, is part of something to do with synchronicity. And then, and we'll get to it actually yeah, we'll get to it later but the the length of this frequency song that was on there was four mm-hmm. minutes 44 seconds which for me is a significant thing and I, we can wait, get to that wait a later. second when you said it was four minutes and 44 seconds was where did you see that timestamp on youtube on instagram when i picked the song on instagram. the length of the song that i could pick from was four minutes 44 seconds on a song Got called it. synchronicity 1111 yeah. whatever yeah. it was yeah. yeah 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 okay got it got it so it's just all of this stuff happens and it's like dude there's it's not coincidence and it feels like there's a certain frequency that we can tap into and and joe rogan talking about that in that moment of time really made me kind of realize that part of it so um in 93 Lollapalooza, the Beastie Boys, uh, and it was Adam Yacht, MCA, who passed away uh, a couple years ago, was into the Free Tibet movement. And he brought the monks of the Drepung Mosling Monastery, and they opened they opened the concert every day. This, this was on, this is 1994. Um, and the way the monks chant, they're not like the Gregorian monks. They have this like, oh, I can't do it. Uh-huh. Um, throat singing? Uh, yeah, like throat singing. Mm-hmm. And uh, the technique is to harmonize with what the, uh, that, uh, that, uh, I, I want to say sect, but it's not sect, but that variant of Buddhism uh, had practiced about uh, tu- tuning in harmony. Yeah. Uh, and so they would use that, I believe, to uh, either bring about certain states, like states of consciousness, or... Um, uh, they said that there, 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 there is something about um, frequency and resonance of uh, the bigger archetypes or things. But anyway, um, I, I, I would suggest doing like a Google search on what Tibetan monks chant got me going down a rabbit hole right now the, the, and the universal uh vibes or concepts that they're actually trying to re- resonate with and um and bring it out <laughs> and i <clears throat> i when, 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 in, in my in my you. training playlist like i have i have a playlist that i use uh that is uh statements from Hold on a second. Oh, okay. You're okay. Dude. Yeah. Dude. I just... Okay. Um, 
Oh. Hold on. You okay? No. Yeah, I, I, I am. I, I, t- I told Angie that I was doing this, and she loves to talk to me. And so oh, I got she's you. calling because she's like, it's not going to go more than 30 minutes. But, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> oh, heavens. Do you need to text um, her back real quick? Hold on one second. No worries. I'm going to go to the bathroom really quickly while you do this. Yeah. So everyone, hold tight for a minute. All right. Um, so if you are just tuning in, uh, welcome back to the Brant Moore Show. Uh, uh, I sold the uh, I sold Factor Freestyle to Brant Moore. Uh, Eddie Fiola wasn't really running Factor Freestyle too well, and so I was gonna. I, I had to make a decision <laughs> that you know either I were gonna sell it to. Gary Pollock and Gary Pollock was going to take Eddie's space as the owner of Factor Freestyle. Like Gary Pollock took Eddie Fiola's place on the Dan Up tour. Uh, but instead, I decided to sell Factor Freestyle to uh, to Brant Moore. So, um, yeah, it's going to be Brant Moore's Factor Freestyle now. Yeah. So, you want to hear how nothing is coincidence ever? I would. I was born July 10th, 1993 at 1.15 p.m. while Lollapalooza was happening. <laughs> and you want to hear how much you want to know how what, crazy in what this ta- is in what town in what town <clears throat> let me look oh I, ha- I literally have my birth certificate right here because i'm applying for a passport <laughs> that i haven't applied for after two months and it's been sitting on my desk <clears throat> waiting for this moment in time for me to <laughs> listen to you in a podcast and need to check when i was born because you said uh, Lollapalooza 93. And I was like, that probably oh happened in god. the summer. Oh my god. Uh, I, was on, I was on tour. Warville, Ohio. Yeah. Ah, all right, there you go. I was I was on. <laughs> so you were talking about something that could have been happening while I was literally in the process of being born. You, while you were being born. Yeah. Literally. How? <laughs> so, okay. So apparently... There's no more wondering. There's some kind of significance, and I need to figure out what my real purpose in life is. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, um, <clears throat> I was shaking so, figuring that out. Just... So, so one of the what one of the techniques you can do is is actually just ask, like, just quietly ask yourself that question. What question? Like, well. What is your purpose? And I think with purpose, it's important to time box it because um, your purpose a few minutes ago was to pee. Yeah, well, I already like. Know why my, are you here? I know my purpose. Right. I've already uh, in, seen it. And 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 for people who are listening, you can actually do this on your own. Uh, you don't have to tell your your friends. Like it's not like you're. It's not like you're going to show up like Eric Cartman and tell your South Park buddies. <laughs> what your purpose is because if you if you have knucklehead friends like a lot of us have knucklehead friends it's not going to go too well mm-hmm. and you don't you don't actually want to show up at the spot telling someone about this massive uh purpose that you dreamt that you have you probably want to keep that stuff close to your chest and you mm-hmm. probably want to reveal these things a little bit at a time as you get closer uh to your goal but but uh, what, what I would say also is if you have a purpose and it's very exciting to you and and if it can pay off very well in terms of like the dopeness that you create, uh, the outcome, the reward is the dopeness that you create, not the props that your friends give you yeah. for having dope plans. And um, uh even though they're your friends, you don't have to tell them your big grand plans all the time because what are they going to do? Right. You mean it's better, uh, just, just to 
like back you up on that. The whole saying, like it's better to move in silence than for everybody to know every move you're going to make is Um, partially like true in that. Just like you don't want to tell everyone everything you are going to do. Let me try to illustrate this. Uh, If I showed up to an AFA contest and I told everyone one at a time about some huge, incredible dream that I had, uh, what the hell would they do with it? Right. And what would be like the point or the reward? I mean, the, the reason I started talking about frog bars is because I was freaked out and I went to Todd Carter and I was like, let me tell you what happened. And Todd <laughs> goes, yeah, well, let me tell you what might be happening. And then I told Claude Hickman and Claude was like, eh, let me tell you what might be happening. Uh, and then when I told Ray, Ray was like, oh my gosh, keep telling me this is incredible. And then it started to become like, comical so like the 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 reward for telling the frog bars was it was it was so unusual but it actually fit it actually became kind of comedic and i was Mm -hmm. like all right well yeah that's very cool and then uh, a couple people started hearing it and they were like wait a second this this happened to me too and this happened to me too and that's why uh uh, that uh, and that kind of motivated, like, hey, you're like, let's do a store, let's let's do a show about frog bars, uh, because it seemed to have clicked with you. It seemed to have clicked with Stony. It seemed to have clicked with a, a few other folks, and um, I, I, look, let's just see where this all goes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, like who, 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 I, I, I. I I gave a somewhat of a definition of frog bars, which is it's an alien entity sent to earth to find and forge fitting humans into proper vessels for the stoke for the purpose of spreading stoke across the planet. I'm totally fine. Yeah. Saying that, um, the rest of it, uh, we're going to see where it goes. Uh, and I'm also, uh, this is, I mean, the, 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 the timing was really good because I set out to do my 50 year edit and to dial in this no handed jump from front wheel to back wheel that you saw me shooting for at Buckeye. I did it once when I was 43 years old, not even kidding. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's on my 2016 year end edit and uh, I touched at the end, I blew the ride out and I, I sneaky touched, like I edited the ride, I edited the touch out and I could not live with that. But, and the only way I could redeem myself is to go back and learn it once it got too much. And it just so happened that I, uh, it became unbearable when I was 50 years old. And so I was already not a spring chicken at 43 years old doing this trick. And now uh, I can't live with myself if I don't pull it and I'm 50. So uh, condition yourself to do that trick when you're 50. That's my mission. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a big deal because bodies are different over the years and it takes a lot of conditioning. And uh, I had to find a why. I had to find my motivation. Uh, And along the way, frog bars happened. I Mm. figured, you know what? Fine. I'm trying, I'm I'm working on dialing this trick at 50. I'm narrowing in on it. I pulled it a couple of days ago, uh, but it slipped out of my ankles after about rolling about eight feet. Uh, But why not throw more on the, on the pile like it's hard enough as it is Mm -hmm. and if now uh i i have the dubious honor of uh having frog bars as part of the story whatevs i'm actually ready for anything (laughs) yeah 
Hell yeah. So let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Hell yeah. With that being said, too, just... No, like, I I brought up the whole concept of frequency, too, to ask uh-huh. you the question, where do you think ideas come from? Oh, wow. Where do I think ideas? Damn, that is a good question. <clears throat> um, just in general, not necessarily trick ideas, just where do you think an idea comes from? What? I think it comes from many places. I'm going to tell, talk about one place. Um, okay. Uh, ideas, ideas will occur. Ideas will occur in your head, regardless of whether you, the thinker, have words to describe them. So that's the first pain in the ass. Mm-hmm. You, uh, you are going to intuit something. You'll, you'll, you'll feel it intuitively. Uh, you, you'll then have a struggle to put, to put it into words. The mm-hmm. first words you choose are always going to be wrong. Yeah. Uh, because you're going to be grasping for them and you're going to put them together and then you're going to, you're going to read them again and you're going to say, is, does this actually match how I feel a hundred percent or is it like 50%? And then you're going to go and you're going to pick a different word. Uh, and then you're going to maybe switch the frame of reference and you're going to refine the idea by playing with the words. Mm -hmm. That's why words are so important because every word has significance and the string of words, um, the string of words, uh, uh, is like is like painting is like painting a picture from like like one facet of it so where the idea comes from i think ideas come from many places mm-hmm. the next part of making the idea communicable that is just an ass load of work <laughs> abs- it's just uh, it's practically unbearable in some cases uh, and let's let's forget about that part. yeah okay sure sure just where you think ideas come from okay the way I explained shrimp rocks to Ray is that shrimp rocks are an antenna that uh, pick up frog bars, and and it it, it helps you uh, connect with wherever these ideas are coming from. It, it, like if you put up an antenna and you pick up a signal, you can watch TV. Uh-huh. But if you're watching TV, you can't figure out where the signal is coming from by watching the television. Mm-hmm. We're saying the same thing here. How often do people have an idea and it just randomly popped into my head? Oh, randomly? Like, that's the, that's the thing where you're like, where'd you, where'd you think of that from? Oh, it just randomly popped into my head. All right. Then Uh... to keep it going even further, like where I'm going with this is that I feel like the exact same concept of signs from the universe and potentially even the the thought of like the frog bars thing is where ideas come from and that we're we as people with our brains are somehow turn tuning in to those ideas like frequency and that oh yeah yeah like i will have uh i i could be working brute force on a storyline and i've been writing lots of stories re- recently or oh, i'll tell you i'll tell you one so um i've been trying to work on the slogan or motto for the Terradome sports science research center and mm-hmm. for years it was the science of the feeling of disbelief mm-hmm. and i was like that's pretty close that's pretty close this feels good um but 
but it like it wasn't it wasn't catching. I wasn't getting the results that I wanted from it. And then one day, uh, I stopped brute forcing it, and I had a really good session. And I go, no, it's the science of the feeling of belief. Not because like when so, when you see something awesome, it is very common for people to say, I can't believe it, or yeah. I didn't, I, I don't believe it, or. Or I couldn't, I I couldn't, I I couldn't believe it. Uh, that's actually stupid to say, uh, but they're borrowing an expression that they heard from someone else. When I changed, when I changed the 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 motto of the Terradome Sports Science Research Center to the science of the feeling of belief, then it made sense. Mm. But it happened when I uh, relaxed and I got a vibe and the vibe was like, I believe this. I'm, this is the feeling of when I believe it. And how can I repeatedly get into a state where I feel that belief and what happens at that point? I land tricks. I invent tricks. I, 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 I get better at BMX when I get into that state. And that's what all of this is about. I had, dude, I had no idea when I said I wanted to get really good at BMX. I had no idea. I had no idea that it would lead me to establishing a sports science research center, uh, writing the words, the science of the feeling of belief. And I had no idea that I would be able to articulate and describe frog bars. <laughs> from trying to get better at bikes, wanting to get better at BMX got me to that point. I had no idea. I did not set out to do this. Well, it's, I mean, BMX in itself just inherently teaches us about every single aspect of life that you could yes. need to learn. But the whole concept of like what I'm saying with ideas and feeling like it's a, it's a frequency thing that we kind of like tune in on. It sounds insane. But when you think about it and when other people might think about it and ask themselves, like, what are the best ideas that I've ever had? And then you uh-huh. think, where did those ideas come from? Where did those ideas come from? And it, every single time it seems like and feels like it's like, oh, it just popped into my head out of nowhere. I have no yeah. idea where it came from. Yeah. And and so this is what leads me to my next like, what the fuck moment in my life. I told you about this one. It was, and this is another thing, like the whole concept that we're talking about in this chat is something that has existed for a long time, apparently. Yeah. I don't know about it. I didn't. I just kind of stumbled upon it and started living this way. But apparently it's existed for a long time. And that's just like, okay, I kind of figured this thing out. Well, there was one that came before that. And, uh, I told you the story. So I'm I'm 16 years old and I found I went back and looked at the screenshot. This screenshot was taken of an email that I sent myself and I don't know how oh I made it really small just now. Of an email that I sent myself 7 July 4th, 2010. So it's a screenshot of an email I sent myself and I sent myself this email as a copy and paste from a note in my iPod touch that came before this. So I was 16 years old when I took this screenshot and I'm going to take it away for a second again, because I don't want people reading it before I fully explain it. But I was 16 years old when I took the screenshot, meaning I was younger than that whenever I actually wrote this. And basically, I feel like what this describes and what I wrote here is, what if every decision anyone ever makes leads them to have a different life and there are alternate, there are alternate, God, I can't speak. And there are alternate realities to where this person mm. lives out every possible mm. decision choice in. And and that first sentence in my eyes and what I understood in myself was it is like talking about the theory of like the, the multiversal theory of 
infinite, the universe being infinite, meaning every single possibility of anything you've ever decided or done in your life exists somewhere. And I wrote this down when I was 16 years old. I was mowing the yard. I'm literally yeah. mowing along, yeah. listening to music on my iPod, got my skull candy headphones plugged in, jamming, drive, 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 thinking about things. And then, boom, this popped into my head. I'm like, er, hold up. I need to type this in my notes on my iPod because this seems crazy. And, like, what if one day this is proven to exist? Then later, come to find out, wait a minute, this is actually a thing that people and, like, real people believe. Yeah. And, and I just randomly had it pop into my head when I'm, 15 or 16 years old mowing the lawn mm -hmm. are you kidding yeah. me like what so the next step is like okay this one i actually kind of feel like could be a thing too but like I actually holy shit i didn't even read the next part but uh it said what if dreams were a vision into these alternate realities uh and <clears throat> and not just your own but everyone else's too where it's like Cert, like because i went on to describe this dream that i had where i was like in my house but everything was a little bit different where like when i was growing up i had a pet snake but in this house i had a pet fish in a fishbowl it's like things like that and mm -hmm. then later on i can't even believe i glossed over this when i was looking at it before it says this would create billions upon billions of alternate realities <laughs> i wrote this and screenshotted it and whatever. I, I wrote this in 2010. It's in my Yahoo email box right now. From yeah, 2010. It's it's, I, I think it's really important uh, to write stuff like write stuff like this down mm -hmm. uh, to keep it in a place of honor to allow your older self to read it. Uh, so that when you get to the point of being your older self and you look back, you can say with confidence that that younger kid who didn't have a lot of confidence wrote something that the older kid could say, uh, a kid's got his head on straight. Mm -hmm. it's, it is very it is very helpful uh, to be honest, not showy, not try to like front like no cap mm -hmm. uh to put those things down to paper to give your future self the uh reason to believe and have confidence in something that you're thinking now not to bullshit people not to get accolades uh but to give yourself the confidence to pursue refining that idea to turn it into something actionable communicable something that you can use in your own pursuit of happiness yeah. uh yeah that's super dope as you were telling me that uh i i remembered another story that uh was kind of frog barzy after i had bought those 500 that 100 pounds of crystal from crazy andy mm -hmm. i put it under my my bed i, I lived on east 17th in columbus and it was just uh, uh, like soda can crates. Um, and I just put it put it under my bed. And I woke up one day and I live with um, a bunch of musicians. And I heard, I woke up to my own voice that I heard from like by my feet. And it just said modulate radio and microphone. And I woke up and I went downstairs. Like I checked underneath the bed and I was like, did you guys pranked me. I was like, because they were electronic musicians. And I was mm. like, I was convinced that they had like shot a sound and like bounced off the, uh, the, the ceiling. Like they had, they had sampled my voice and strung it together. Like how Howard Stern uh, used to do with like characters, mm. like people who would read their audio books, he would take yeah. the, the words and string them together. And I was convinced they had done that. And they were looking at me like I was absolutely mad. <laughs> I was like, okay, so it wasn't a prank, was it? Like, I had had dreams, but I had never had a dream 
uh, where it sounded like the where, where I had never had a dream where the sound of the dream woke me up, uh, and and I, I woke up like I wasn't dreaming anything at the time that I woke up. Mm-hmm. It was just like blank, but I was like woken up, and I that which is why I, I like ran downstairs and started accusing my <laughs> my yeah. roommates of pranking me. Um, uh, I, you know, for a lot of years, I tried to decode that. Like, and when I went to Hawaii and studied Huna, uh, we did these dream interpretation workshops, and I tried to make sense of that. And it's funny because um, if you try to make sense of something that is even just like random, somehow either you find patterns in it or you find that in the randomness it reminds you of of other concepts that have nothing to do with the randomness, but they're like, a, they, they, they are symbols to other, to other concepts and you end up working up those other concepts. Anyway, there's, there, there's so much productive stuff that, that, that can come from quiet contemplation um, of dreams like that. And it can do, it can do wonders. Uh, it can do wonders for, for, for your life, actually. That makes sense. In pursuit of happiness. That makes sense. And, yeah so like the point i was driving out with that whole story and asking where ideas come from is like oh yeah where did that come from in my yeah you were a kid i'm a a 15 or 16 year old kid who i mean at that point in time maybe they were talking about it on tv but what year was that 2009 or 10 but even at that rate like I would, I don't know where that came from. I had no way to explain it. I mean, I'm just mowing the yard, thinking about whatever, listening to music. Like I, it's not like I'm contemplating the universe and you were not reading physics. You were not reading a physics textbook. Right. It's, yeah, yeah. it was so it was like, where did that come from? And I'm glad that I wrote it down and then had the sense yeah. to be like, okay, <laughs> this is really important because if I write this down and then go back later and then find out that this is a real thing, that means something. Even when I was 16 years old, I recognized the importance of that and still to this day use the same email address so I can search it up and pull Mm -hmm. up the exact email. And so that leads me to the next thing. I made a note in my phone of, uh, the dreams and what I wrote was serendipities and crossed it out and put synchronicities. Uh, so I have dreams. I only have one dream in here, but uh, I have a lot of synchronicities that I wrote in here and I could tell stories on these for ever, honestly. But, Oh my gosh. So, no, there's one about the universe. And this is partially where some of this stuff comes from. Because that Rick Rubin dude, you know what I'm talking about? He started Def Jam Records. Yeah, yeah. Hmm? He, in his podcast with Guess Who, <laughs> talked about signs from the universe guiding you to where you need to be. Like, if if people are listening to this and you want another step in this from a totally outside perspective, go listen to that one because they talk about it. But... I recorded the screen and I didn't keep the video part of it, but I recorded the screen and sent it to my girlfriend and, uh, she, let me read this first. Either way, uh, I sent her that. And then apparently her cousin, I think it's her cousin sent her some horoscope thing that essentially said like the same thing at the exact same time. (laughs) Which is pretty uh, funny. The, these, you know, Stoney's been doing this thing where he, in his stories, he takes this picture of him holding a frog bars, mm-hmm. uh, the sticker, and then he plays pop songs that seem to describe frog bars. And it's, they're like Katy Perry songs. 
Well, I, dude, I'm convinced that this is just, it's deeper than even what we're talking about with it. Oh, for, for sure. I mean, like you can see it appear, you can, you can see this appear in art. You can see this appear in song. Uh, you can see this appear in, uh, in literature, in movies. There is this one movie that it had Steve Martin in it and he was on the back lot of a of a uh, of a movie studio and he goes don't you know that all of life's mysteries are hidden in the movies and it's just these storytellers in hollywood uh answering these little uh mysteries in in the movies and mm-hmm. uh we, when you have a when when it when I and I'm not, I, I think this is probably an experience shared by other people, but I'm going to say it for me because I don't I haven't surveyed yeah. a bunch of people. Uh, when I intuit some idea, but I can't put words to it, and and I move on in my life, and I don't try to put words to it, and then I come across a movie that has some of that in it, I'm immediately fascinated mm-hmm. by it. I'm immediately fascinated by it. There's a there's a, a movie uh, called Dark City that I remember seeing once. Uh, and when I when I started watching the watching it, I was flipping through channels when I was in Cancun, and it was Jennifer Connelly was playing a lounge singer, and she was singing a rendition of the Dean Martin song Sway, and uh, it was a great rendition, and I was just fascinated by it, and I finished watching like the movie dark city great movie um but it told the story of uh these phenomena that i felt like i was intuiting that i felt like i recognized but i didn't have words to it Mm -hmm. that's wonderful fascination and you can go right down the line you can go down the line with with um the matrix uh i grew up I saw Star Wars for the first time when I was three years old. Uh, that was uh, that was captivating. But like the the movies that have really like captured my imagination, um, that have fascinated me. Um, Pulp Fiction, like the dialogue in Pulp Fiction, was incredible. The way they were debating in the um, in the hallway about the foot massage, I was just blown away. Uh, by that whole thing and so i would say part of this like following 43 following frog bars is uh one of the indications is what fascinates you and everybody's going to be fascinated by something different for different reasons Uh, but if you follow what fascinates you and study what fascinates you uh it, it you're, you're, you're going to get closer to understanding more, well, one, more about what fascinates you, but um, you're going to understand the characters that fascinate you. And by understanding the relationships between the f- characters that fascinate you, I have kind of found where I prefer to live my life. Mm-hmm. So you sort of like writing your life story by bringing into it characters that fascinate you. There was this exercise that I remember a school teacher or someone in elementary school was like, hey, uh, what's your favorite animal? Like, just what, what, what is your favorite animal? And then everybody told the animal and they said, that's the way you see yourself. And um, it's like, all right, well, that's cool. What, what types of characters in movies fascinate me? What, ty- like, what are the things that I, I, I love in my life? And those all become, you know, when you bring them into your regular life, that's kind of like uh, all of the things that occupy a very pleasant dream. And in the dream world, obviously, it's all in your head. Ergo, it's all you. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's a great way of orienting yourself and getting to understand, uh, understand what, 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 what constitutes a happy life for you and uh 
figuring out what constitutes a happy life for you and how to pursue that is like the highest pursuit ever. I think part of that is what drives me so nuts when I see people who are living the life because, oh, that's just what everybody's supposed to do. And ABD. Just, yeah, just like this is this is it. The American dream. Like we do this because this is what we're supposed to do and don't ask questions. And that's just what people do in life. And nothing has driven me more crazy than watching people, especially friends, following that life and just like part of me is envious of like, man, I wish that what would make me happy in life would be so simplistic of like, do this happy life. Like you do what you feel like you're supposed to do because that's just what people do. And that makes you happy. But it's just like, that's just not what it is for me. And I feel like I've stumbled upon this thing that when you follow the signs from the universe and just what it feels like you're supposed to be doing, you have even more fulfilled and happy life. But at the end of the day too, it's like, it's all life is freestyle. Even like in Word. the people who are following what they're supposed to do, because that's just what you do in life is if they're happy, that's all that matters for them. But another thing I like to call some of those people is NPCs. Oh yes. This and I'm going to keep going. I'm going to recharge my, oh, yeah, my you're good. pods one at a time. So, the NPC concept was funny to me and is funny to me because it feels like it's hundred percent real. When you pay attention, when you're out in public and you're like, Oh my God, it's an NPC. You just go to Walmart on a Friday night. You see people just bumping into each other and just like, Oh, I'm just here. And it's like, yep, those are the NPCs. And what struck me while we were talking earlier is when you're talking about people who seem to just not be able to grasp the concept we're trying to explain tonight. And I think that this whole NPC conversation is part of that. Like mm. there's, I feel like, the, and this is where we're going to get shut down by whoever's running all this, but like whoever's <laughs> running all we're, this, there's going to be a disruption of the broadcast. Yeah. But like, <laughs> It feels like there's there's main character people and then there's NPCs. Have you seen the movie Free Guy? With Ryan Reynolds? It's recent. You need oh, to, yeah, 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 yeah. That Ryan movie awesome. yeah. feels like it's a partially a like reality because it feels like there's certain people who can tune into this thing and other people just can't. And those people are the ones that are the NPCs. And like the certain people who can't be red pilled, it's like, and, and it's weird because even in my own life, and this might have people like wondering, like, am I the NPC? <laughs> like, but even in my own life, I see people and I'm like, if you wonder if you're an NPC, you are not an NPC. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> what's, what's your experience with that? I mean, I just, it feels like it's a real thing. I mean, there is one time that I was, uh, I had gone to lunch, uh, at this mall near the office and it was around the time of the dot com boom and bust, which was crazy. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I remember out of the corner of my eye, I saw a dude who was just sitting at like the food court, just frozen. And I was like, <laughs> I just kept walking. I didn't like inspect him, but I was like, <sighs> I mean, that's the closest that I had come to this encountering this concept of, 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 of an NPC. I didn't, I, I have to admit, I like, I didn't try to blue feather it. Like I didn't try to go looking mm -hmm. for it. I saw that one and I was like, mm -hmm, a little bit creepy. Yeah. Um, uh, but you know, since I had heard, and what does it stand for? Non, Non-player character. Character. Non yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I will. How about, how about you go investigate the NPCs? I'm not ready to go investigate. I don't the have NPCs. to investigate. It's just weird, man. It's one of those things. It's like, 
you see certain people and and you see the way that like they can be pre- it's it's a good conversation to have with this is the people who are so far from the reason like there's this there's this concept of the reasonable middle where it's like people who are literally just looking at topics from whatever side and then taking a reasonable stance in the middle or whatever it might be. And just like, I, I understand this. I understand this. My stance is nuanced and depends on that. It's, I feel like a lot of it is these people who are so far on the outside of being reasonable that they, it's like, it's almost programmed into them that they can't listen to reason with things because they're the NPC that's designed for this certain specific thing that they can't, their brain or their programming, whatever it is, can't even fathom the outside of that. This is where I'm losing people. They're like, this dude really no, is no, no, crazy. I mean, it, like NPC, I, I I have heard this concept of the NPC. I so it's not, not new. It. Look either. <laughs> well, uh, well, the the term <clears throat> what uh the dude in the mall was um that must have been 1999 probably mm-hmm. i was i uh, <clears throat> i think i remember uh 98 99 i think it was before i think it was before the crash mm-hmm. i think we, i uh i was i was it was, it was it was about at the peak because i can kind of remember the mood that i was in yeah uh and the, the mood was everything's going to be great forever <laughs> mm. <laughs> and it turns out it was not it was not great across the board forever um yeah yeah good Good, good, good times. I, 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 I've lived through, uh, I've lived through a few uh, technology uh, and economic and geopolitical uh, big events. Like mm-hmm. I, I, I've lived through a couple of black swan yeah. events, and um, yeah, that that does that that does rock people's worlds. So maybe this dude was uh, had just seen some economic data <laughs> oh yeah it was just like holy smokes this is mm. all going to come crashing down like yeah who knows what what his day was like <laughs> that's funny it yeah i don't know it's one of those things i think about sometimes and it just it feels you know some of these concepts just feel like it just feels right like when you think of it and yeah. you're just like yes that is that is true it's it just is i don't know why but it just is yeah 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 um uh getting from intuiting that uh every decision uh splits the universe Uh, going from an, an intuitive understanding like that to meticulously uh, expressing the mathematics is so much work. Oh, I'm sure. It's so much work. And I think that's probably why a lot of our, there's there's probably a larger universe of ideas um, that are uh, intuited than there are the universe of ideas that have been uh, articulated and made um, uh and, and and made into uh yeah, applied so yeah so like um I, I einstein had this idea that time will pass differently depending on how fast you were going yep and it was described with such precision that it was used in the uh that it's actually used in the programming of the gps satellites wow and so, uh, like, if you just took the data, the raw data feed from the GPS, you would not find yourself properly on the Earth when you adjust it for 
uh, space-time relativity, then you can find where you are on the Earth. But that took a hell of a lot of work to get to that point. But that's amazing and, um, to think about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like scientists, scientists and engineers do this stuff all the time. Like you have, you have artists who will uh, articulate this stuff and like, you can go back throughout the history of art to where these concepts get introduced by the beatniks, by the surrealists. Um, I was at the, I was at a symposium for Salvador Dali at the Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia museum of art where, um, like the Rocky statue was. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were talking about Dali's view because like, I want to say that uh, the atom bomb had been detonated. There was this understanding of what happens with like splitting the atom. I'm trying to remember it was before the atom bomb, but it was around the time of splitting the atom. And Dali was, was a Christian. He was very, uh, he was very religious. He was into this esoteric Christianity, and he would he he would do paintings about what existed inside the atom. And they the, the professors were up there, and there was he hung out with this groupie who went by the name of Ultraviolet. And I don't know if she was an artist, if she was a groupie or whatnot, but she was she ran with uh, around with, with Dolly. And when they asked for questions from the audience, I, I raised my hand and I, and I asked, so any of the stuff that he wrote about, has any of the stuff been tested? Like, how do you tell if it's fantasy from some surrealist painter mm -hmm. or if he actually encountered something and they just looked at one another and they're like, what the fuck's this guy talking about? Why would anyone want to test this stuff? And I'm like, <laughs> well, <laughs> right? And I was like, well, I mean, if you're praising a guy for his art and then you say that it was around the time of splitting the atom like wouldn't you want that to be correct rather than just like imaginary thinking mm -hmm. but they had no time for that um but um you know ultimately there there are these vanguards who have these ideas who can find words that are communicable but if you're working like in two dimensions with paint there are things that you can paint that are absolutely impossible to actually happen in the real world and that's when um uh that's when the, the writers the philosophers come in that's where the scientists come in that's where the uh the engineers come in and uh you can prove the truth of something by measuring its efficacy. So mm -hmm. does it actually work in the real world? Um, the frog bar stuff, I, I, I have been making memes of the little uh, messages that frog bars, that I that feel like, oh, this is the frog bars thing. Um, and so the efficacy is, does it work to heighten focus uh, in, in, in training for BMX tricks. Now we're not talking about like, can be, it, can it be applied to fly planes? You know, that's, that's something different. Mm -hmm. I'm doing all of this, uh, to figure out, is it useful in, in cultivating a mindset that will, uh, help me get to being better at BMX yes. and the frog bar stuff seems to have efficacy in getting me to get better at BMX. We've and all the proof of that. that. <laughs> yes. And the proof of that is going to be in this video that I release for my 50th, for my 50 year. I and love it. It's going to be in the zine. And so that's how I, that's how I'm proving this stuff. Like if frog bars, so let me give you an example. If frog bars were to say, sleep in late and drink a lot of beer all day. <laughs> I would say that's probably not advice coming from an alien entity that is sent to earth to find and forge fit humans to be proper vessels for the stoke. <laughs> it's just not good advice. <laughs> Thank you for it saying that. It doesn't help me. Thank you for saying that. Because that just reminded me of a topic I thought of this morning, but totally <laughs> forgot to write down. But awesome. before I get there, actually, no, screw it. We'll do it now. 
<laughs> because I wondered if part of this is what helps me with this is that I I don't claim the title that comes with this, but I have never drank, smoked, done any kind of drug or anything other than if I had when I had to take Vicodin for an injur- injury. Yeah. Like anything like that. Mm-hmm. But I've never done it any of that before in my entire life. Uh, That is a good sign that the experience you are having is completely natural. Oh, a hundred percent. And maybe that's how it's proven. Guess what? There it is. That's how you can prove that it's completely natural because I've literally never once in my life done that stuff. Right. Uh, what they, uh, what people will say, uh, some will jump immediately to, are you insane? Mm-hmm. Uh, others will, will jump to, are you on drugs? Uh, what they, uh, what, what they should be asking, but they don't is, have you been getting much sleep? <laughs> because sleep deprivation, uh, has, uh, has hallucinogenic uh, effects. That's funny. Um, yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of those types of types of checks uh, oh. that folks should have. I, 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 I give it the efficacy check because I've, I've been, uh, well, I, I was, a, I, I was a kid at one time. I'm mm-hmm. not a kid now, but I've had these ideas as a kid um, that were, fantasy thoughts maybe i saw them or i mean you know kids come up with all sorts of weird ideas yeah um just at random Uh, but the ideas that that stick around are the ideas that are that are effective makes sense yeah man what a crazy conversation what a crazy conversation yeah welcome to Welcome, welcome to brand more BMX. Welcome to BMX, ladies and gentlemen. More BMX. Oh, um, it's I good w- stuff, man. Because no one's so. Uh, uh, here's the other thing. I I don't know that this is like th- this is not something that is part of the come up. What do you mean? Like th- this is this is you you are doing something on a podcast on a BMX podcast that is not done on BMX podcast. MBD bitches. And BD bitches. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you That's right. because I felt like you'd probably know. And, and maybe we do this and continue this another time too, where we talk mm-hmm. about uh, the uh, like research side of things that you've done, where you've like looked into this stuff because I've done mm-hmm. nothing. But I'm curious mm-hmm. is there is there significance to the number 444 that you're aware of? Um, uh, well, it's repeating. So like one, 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 four, four, four. The reason I asked, was it on YouTube is, uh, when I cut, when I cut YouTube videos that are to 43 seconds, uh, when you tap through and you start playing it, it will show four minutes, 43 seconds. But when you look on the preview, uh, it will show four minutes, 44 seconds. And so YouTube's uh, time stamp measurement is different in, in different parts of its system. So yeah. that's why I asked, which was, was it all, was it 444 or was there a 43 in there? That's I why gotcha. I asked. Yeah. Well, so what was significant about that song being 444, just that's a number that I've always used is the fact that it's like, it's been my favorite number since I was like 14 or 15. And it's one that I just use as one of those signs for the universe. I told you mm. the story of the the sheets thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very quickly I will say that I was driving home from a session, was going to go one place to eat, Was saw a sign for another place, was like, oh, that would be cool. I like that too. Where's my sign from the universe that I should go there instead? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Driving along other side of the highway weird there's nobody on that side of the highway except some cop cars and a group of cops standing around weird keep driving come up to the exit for the place that i thought oh this would be cool too sign on the side of a building right there 
phone number ends in 4444. I'm like, well, guess we're going there. That's my instead. jam. Yeah, guess we're going there. <laughs> and then I re- then I see later on that there was a road rage incident on that highway that someone literally got shot. And the whole entire highway was shut down, which was the side of the highway that to go to where I was originally going to, I would have to backtrack through to get back home that way when I had to go a different way. So therefore changing where I went changed my route to get home, which meant I didn't have to deal with that. And all of that came through the number 444, which has just been a reoccurring thing. If I'm driving and I see a 444 on a license plate while I'm thinking about making a decision, I just do whatever I was going to do and stuff like that. But the significance for me is literally none. The reason I chose this number was because it was the time code where my favorite part of a song that wasn't even my favorite part of the song start or my favorite song started. Like this song, I don't I haven't listened to this song in 10 years. It was just I liked the part of the song that started at 444. So I was like, eh, this is my favorite number now. And that's where that came from so if i find out that there's like this ancient significance to the number oh my heavens which following I'm, yeah uh all right so andy pandemic uh has been in the chat I, the entire time oh so my know. gosh he's so much fun he's so much fun um he and i were working on a uh like a 43 through history. Yeah. And Andy found, <laughs> this is so great. Andy, uh, went looking, uh, he followed, he went looking at the pyramid builders mm. and he went looking at the ratios and the structure in uh, Egyptian pyramids. And there was this one, there was this one, like hidden secret tunnel that was 43 feet below the earth. And there were all, there were, there were a couple of 43s in it, but here's the thing. He goes, Hey Joe, uh, it was 43 feet below the earth, but they didn't have feet as units of measure when they built the pyramids. (laughs) And I was like, Oh, wait a second to find the ratios, you have to do a survey of multiple units of measure because you could be using a unit of measure that would never calculate to 43 as a ratio. There is a certain unit of measure like feet, imperial units, that when you measure down, it will result in 43 and he, he, he traced this, he traced that, I want to say to, uh, a frog God, because a lot of the, uh, it was a polytheistic religion and there were, uh, like gods that were rendered with different animal heads. And so he, he traced the frog back to the, like to the pyramid builders in South America. It was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. That I'm so stoked. Insane. We, 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 um, we got, we got very busy and we, we, we did not complete the production where I, I want to say probably 75% of the way through of it, uh, between the research, uh, putting together the graphics and then writing the talk track. Man. But it's all, it, it, it's awesome. It is so crazy. much fun I'm ex- because you trace this stuff, you trace this stuff through, sorry for, for, for jumping in, but like you trace this stuff through about your preferences and maybe they're, um, maybe they're uh, patterns of numbers, maybe they're words, maybe they're animals. And you, you can trace that back through uh, religious iconography mm-hmm. that, you, you know, anthropomorphized gods from like animals spirit animals or whatnot right uh and you, it and it, 
you can follow your intuition back through archetypal figures and that is so much fun to do it is so much fun to do yeah and it brings up the concept too of confirmation bias i feel like oh yes yeah. there's definitely going to be a little bit of that in this whole thing and and that was something remember earlier when i was like oh i wanted to say something but i couldn't figure out what a how and yes. whatever it was this confirmation bias and i recognize yeah. that this concept might have some confirmation bias involved with it but at the end of the day i feel like one if it's not hurting anyone and it makes you mm -hmm. feel better and feel like you're mm -hmm. living life better who cares mm -hmm. and two who cares anyways because it just it is what it is and if there is confirmation bias there i it's not like it's a negative thing that's coming from it yeah i mean uh you are you uh brant are not writing public policy that affects other people's lives there you go and so that's cool um you are going to make your own decisions about it you're not going to render a judgment about other people yeah. pretty dope uh and you're gonna measure the efficacy the effectiveness of this by looking at something else so like uh if i do this thing and it leads to a happy life great uh a life that's in balance a life that's free of self-destructive behaviors um and if you can uh live this life and tell people about it but not but not demand from them that they uh, kiss your ass or, or or think you're cool like in bmx if you If you want to have friends in BMX, uh, you have Stoke, you share Stoke, and you use Stoke uh, to do tricks. And um, if you, like, C Carl Hinckley was telling me the story that uh, he would have jams and he would have pros and they would do, like, you know, 360 double double whip and people will give props and then some kid who's like super young does his bur his first bar spin and the place goes equally mm -hmm. mad because it's not about the trick it's about uh the trick relative to where you were at the time and the other tricks that you were doing yep and so if it was your personal best, that's so dope. That's so dope. Now, when what Jed Milton did the quad back flip at Pastrana land, that was insane, not only for him, but it was insane for everyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you get like, I, I watched, I, I watched one of Carl's uh, little homies. I, Think he was trying to do a whatever it was but the kid was like wrecking like wrecking hard and getting back up and wrecking hard and getting back up and then he pulled it and i was like yo that is so dope like that's the stoke mm -hmm. that riders will feed off of one another because it's about watching a dude watching a rider because of course women ride too uh, doing something dope where they push themselves and they got that because if we celebrate pushing ourselves, everyone can have the stoke mm -hmm. and no matter what level you're at to get to that next thing that you, you gotta just, you gotta push yourself. Like that's the thing to be celebrated. The, the greatest guy in the world right now, that's great, but that doesn't overshadow the kid who's earlier in his riding pursuit, pushing himself well beyond, right? Cause like. I got a good saying for this. Yeah. The best thing you've ever done is the best thing you've ever done. Whether it's Dennis oh, Anderson good. doing the best thing he's ever done 
and pushing himself, yeah. it's no different, or should be no different than the 13 year old kid who's doing the best thing he's ever done. And BMX is yeah. basically just a series of people trying to find the feeling of doing the best thing we've ever done over and over and over again. That's awesome. The best thing you've ever done is the best thing you've ever done. Yeah. 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 That's, I mean, like that's a, that's a wild pursuit. I think that's a beautiful that's, pursuit. That is BMX. That's that anything is, that makes that's people BMX. happy. I mean, anything, that's BMX. anything people do that makes them happy that they do more than once, it's that. And, and it could come in the form of knitting. It could come in the form of playing chess and beating someone who is at a level yeah. you've never beaten before. Or it come in, yeah. could come in the form of a 13-year-old kid doing his first bunch of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're in BMX, and this is what we, this is what we study. Yeah, so there's one last thing on my list and I don't know if by you... the by the way, just just hold up the pages so we can see how many pages I want well, well, it's all in my notes app, but I oh, want, okay. I want people to understand that <laughs> when I said earlier that I told Joe that my brain was firing at two hundred percent and that I was in that frequency, I had three bullet points in this notes list and they were super basic. It went from that to this in a matter of 10 or 15 minutes. Oh my goodness. It was so good. insane. The The only other topic thing that I had written down was uh -huh. uh, you told me to ask you about your Hawaiian mentor. Oh yeah, Pohaku. Yeah, so I yeah. wondered like if you wanted to get super into that or if you wanted to save it or... Um, well, uh, actually, I think his podcast is still around for a period. When he first introduced it, he called it Jedi Trainer, which is how I found it. Hmm. He then received um, a letter from Lucasfilm and <laughs> he changed it to hmm. Huna Trainer. Um, but uh, Huna, H-U-N-A, is the, is the Hawaiian uh, shamanism. And I, I started listening to the podcast and they said, <clears throat> he's like, Hey, I'm going to do a workshop in Hawaii. And, uh, here's the way you're going to get to it. You, and he gave an exercise on how to find money. Oh, and he said the, the cost of the workshop is 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 your logistics but you have to agree that you don't just go to your mom and ask her for money you have to and even if you have the money sitting in the bank don't use that money go find the money and he gave an exercise and i was like how's this going to work but uh i did the exercise and i found the money hmm. and i went and we spent a week uh, on uh, Honolulu, we, we, we spent a few days on Kauai and then we spent uh, another couple days on Honolulu. Uh, I learned to body surf at Makapu'u and you know, he taught us how to body surf. He, 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 he taught us this stuff. Years later, I went back to study with who he studied with, Serge Kahili King. Um, Angie and I went there. We stayed at the top of the big island on a volcano. Uh, and who knew that if you were staying at an Airbnb on a volcano, it's actually really, really cold. <laughs> 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 Serge lives on the top of this volcano. And so he was, he was running that. Um, and so I told Pohaku that I was going to do this. And he's like, you realize that was 20, that was almost 20 years ago. Wow. And I'm like, man, it's, 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 it, it's for real. And I feel very uh, fortunate that somehow in BMX during the course of training myself to do 
what might be the hardest trick. I don't know if my no handed jump is the hardest trick that's ever been done in flatland. Mm -hmm. Once I, once I get it on film, uh, you know, five times, I will then go around to all of my mentors and coaches and I will ask them to stack rank the hardest flatland tricks ever done. Uh, and we'll see where it lands. And then I will ask the second question, which is what is the hardest trick ever done by a 50 year old? (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. Um, but I had no idea that it would, uh, that it would lead to this concept of frog bars. And, uh, I had no idea that it would lead to this concept of frog bars. Like I had no idea that in a state of hyperstoke, I would hear something beautiful in my dream, uh, the night of my coronation as a plywood hood. I had no idea. I mean, I, I had heard of other people, um, and what it was like for them to be, uh, invited into the, the plywood hoods. I, I, uh, I had, it was, it was one day, I want to say in 2022 or late 21, when I was like, I, I had been silent, quietly auditioning for the team for eight years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I, 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 I said that. And it caught the attention of Chris Young. And there's a, Chris Young and I have a very interesting story. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting to me. In probably like 89 or 90, uh, I was riding for this bike shop, this Schwinn bike shop in Strongsville, Ohio. And I get in and they say, hey, there's a message for you. Uh, this 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 mom moved to town this mom moved to town and she's looking for riders for her son and i I call the number and she's yeah my son's you know chris he uh he just turned expert and um he's looking for people to to to, to ride with and i was like yeah that's cool let's 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 ride and so we we met up in um around berea in berea and we were sessioning it was it was late at night and I was like, Hey, let's, let's check out this in like office park, industrial park. And there was a, a grass bank to wall. And I was like, let's, let's hit this. We are sessioning this, this wall. <clears throat> and this one run I take at it, I hit a rabbit hole and it bleeds all my speed, but I pull up and I hit the wall and I slide down. And when I wreck, the bars go into the ground and my leg goes right on top of the bar. And I'm just like, I'm hobbling, I'm hobbling, I'm hobbling. So that was kind of a session ender. And we agreed we're going to go to Berea Rolling Bowl the next, the next day, which was, it was a roller skating rink they converted and put ramps in. <clears throat> and I get there and I'm just, I can't, I can't put any weight on my leg. Dave Norrie tells the story that uh, that's the last time Chris Young wanted to ride with you because you suck so bad, <laughs> which might have been the case. Anyway, a couple months later, I'm in Killington, Vermont, and we're about to we're about to go up on the mountain and it's 20 below at the top of the mountain. Uh, And I'd never skied in anything that cold. And I'm in the shower and I look down and I see a golf ball sized dome on my leg and I put my finger into it like like any good young man when there's a bubble uh, he, he pokes on it and my finger goes down through the bubble and right, right through my leg muscle like that. And I go, I have a hole in my leg muscle. And so the whole trip, I'm like showing people and having them stick their finger in this hole that I have in my leg muscle. I can put weight on it at this point. It doesn't hurt. And I'm like, where the hell did this thing come? Did it come from? And I remember I was riding with Chris Young. And so, uh, I had taken several years off to start my career. I had stopped riding, I want to say, like uh, ni- ni- late 94, actually. I moved to South Miami Beach. Uh, when I got back into riding in 2002, I would go up to Changa every so often. And every so often, Chris would be there. And I would say, hey, Chris, 
um, for the past 15 years, I've thought of you every day in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you do that? And I told him the story about how I have a hole in my leg muscle. Um, Chris was the one who advocated for me when he heard that I was had been auditioning for the Plywood Hoods. Mm. And uh, that hole in my leg muscle was the first of the rabbit holes. <laughs> I went down. Oh, oh, got him. And, you know, the, the thing was, uh, between the time I, I, I got that rabbit hole and I want to say it was probably 92, 93, I had ordered Dorkin New York 5 from Trend, uh, uh, Trend Bike Source, which I think became Empire. And I was watching it in that um, duplex that we rented on East 17th. And Chris Young's part came up and I was like, that dude is in Dorkin in New York. <laughs> Because I, this was the last time. This is the was first and last time I had ridden with him, uh, you know, back at, back in the day. And then I saw, and I would, I would go back home to Cleveland, and I would hear stories like what happened with Chris Young, and what was his story of how he found the plywood hoods. And it is the craziest, frog barziest <laughs> story. Um, yeah, and we talk about that now, and with Flatline Assassins, like. Chris and I have had uh, like 6 a.m. phone conversations that we call the Church of Stoke. And we just mm. dig in to this stuff deep and it's, it's, it's meaningful and it's actionable and it helps you uh, be a better writer because it focuses you on the Stoke, not about Instagram followers, not about any of this uh, petty you know, who done it first jokes. I make, I make jokes about who done it first and all that ridiculousness on factor freestyle, because I think it's, I think it's funny that people spend energy on it and I spend a lot of energy on it, but I like make fun of the pettiness. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it, the stoke is the real fuel uh, that binds people in the community and uh, frog bars was sent to earth to find and forge fitting humans into proper vessels for the stoke. And that is what the way of the stoke instructs <laughs> how to be uh, a proper vessel for the stoke. <clears throat> I've defined frog bars. I wrote it down. I have a word definition of it. I would love to hear the word definition of it. You have to tell me first if I'm an over prepper. I I don't think I could call I don't think I, 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 I do not have a leg to stand on to call anyone else an over prepper. <laughs> I don't uh, even know but I means, appreciate but... that you went to the over prepping hundred percent. And you know what? I'm gonna call you an over prepper and I'm gonna say that is a good thing. Yeah, Andy just asked if I'm an over prepper, <laughs> so I wondered what that meant. Oh, so here's the uh, here, here's where the over thing came from. One day, uh, we, we were doing a show, and we want it was it was supposed to be with Volker, and he's like, "Hey, I'm driving I'm driving to a ride out. Can we, you know, do it from the car?" It was um, Mike Parenti, Volker, Pete Augustine, and John B was driving, and. <laughs> And Dave would tell the story about the first time he met Bob Harrow. And he's like, you know, it was Bob Harrow. And I, I just did my run. And Bob shook my hand. And he just crushed my hand. And he goes, I'm so glad that it happened after my run. Because I don't know if I would have been able to ride. <laughs> and Pete Augustine heard that story. And he goes, that mother effer did the same thing to me. And Pete goes off on how Bob like caught him off guard and shook his hand real hard. And, and to this day, every time he sees Bob Harrow, he like, he's like, let's go again. Let's go again. <laughs> and so this, we found this so funny. And I was like, 
is this the Bob Haro signature grip or is this Bob Haro as an over gripper? <laughs> and so we started asking people, is Bob like factor freestyle, Bob Haro is an over gripper? And they're like, what are you talking about? And Dave tells a story, and then he tells a story about Pete. And people are like, yeah, actually he is. <clears throat> and we uncovered that in fact Bob Haro was for a period of his of his um career an overgripper. And so I we like leaned into this so hard and I went to the Woodward uh West reunion in 2021 <coughs> with the purpose of meeting Bob and overgripping him and <laughs> and John John B John Bolgens gave me tips but the person who helped me actually get in was Eddie Fiola and here's what Eddie Fiola did we simulated it ahead of time <laughs> and we did it in slow motion how I had to come in from on top, get in, and I had I had to get I had to I had to get to the knuckle. And so I, I had to make sure that I got in, I locked in on the thumb, okay, and then I could sweep up. And Eddie and I did this five <laughs> times. <laughs> and and we roll up and Dave Dave distracts. Okay, because Bob's out there signing autographs in his booth. Eddie rolls up. Eddie is smooth as anything. And he goes, oh, hey, have you met Bob? And Bob's like, yeah. And I swooped in and I hold it and I'm squeezing. And Bob's like, what am I doing? And Dave's like, Joe, are you over gripping Bob Harrow? Fantastic. I overgrip Bob Haro. There's an amazing like <laughs> shot of me smiling like the little girl in the meme with the house burning down and Bob is just looking at his hand. Fantastic. James McGraw captured everything. James did great. James turns off the camera and I asked Bob who taught him how to overgrip. And Bob told me the most amazing story of a sales guy who taught him how to overgrip. There's always an origin story. Yeah. There's always an origin story. That <clears throat> so that's amazing. that's the overgripper thing. I spent a year. We spent a year tro trolling, comedically, doing this with Bob Haro. Ultimately, for me to go uh, and and overgrip him my on film. Goodness! Wow! And this is what I do with my, and this is what I do with my time. <laughs> that's amazing. I can't. <laughs> I can't wait to do another one of these and learn more. Yes. <laughs> so I don't even, yeah. Uh, are you ready for my I am totally words? ready now. Let's do it. All right. Let me make sure that it's correct. It was correct because I wrote it in the right frequency. The concept of frog bars is tapped into via a frequency of intuition that allows us to tune into wherever or whatever this comes from and pay attention to signs from the universe or in paying attention to signs from the universe is how we dial into the correct frequency. Yep. 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 Uh -huh. Dave, uh, yeah. It's yeah, in words that's though. Dope. That's dope. That's dope. I, w when I'm, um, when I'm having a session, <clears throat> so, okay, there's frog bars, there's the Teradome Sports Science Research Center, but something happens when everything gets dialed in. Uh, it is uh, it is a realm that I call Thunder World. Mm -hmm. And in Thunder World, anything is possible. Yep. And you, you don't feel exhaustion. Yep. Uh, it's, you have stoke, it puts you into a state, but that state, creates a portal that's thunder world that's when dopeness happens so you use the stoke to build a state you whip it up that causes a portal to open a pure potentiality that's thunder world that's when dope tricks happen aka what other people know as star power star power that's what we call it like when someone's doing a run and they're landing every oh, single yes. trick. Every single thing. And then all of a sudden, at the end of their run, they try something they've never done before and land it. 
Yeah, I learned pop tarts uh, in a in a in a show, and a pop tart is when you're uh, you're just riding on your pedals, you have your hands on the top of the bars, and you just leap up and mm. let go at the same time and land on the bars. Mm -hmm. I learned jump of doom in a in a show. That's a frame stand jump to to bar ride. Mm. Um, it's like second or third try, and that's that's insane. The first, when I reunited with Zach, I did a pop tart on, um, I think I was riding a Hoffman Condor at the time, but I was so stoked to like meet up with my homie Zach again. We were on top of this ramp. We we're just rapping. And he goes, who did you used to ride with? And I go, I rode with the Youngstown guys, uh, uh, George Clark, Joe Bellino, Zach Yankish. And he goes, I'm Zach. But I knew him <laughs> when he was like, yeah. 13, 12, 13, something like that. That's funny. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. When, when you get into that state and it's star power in Thunderworld, dude, historical things will happen on a bike. Yep. And, and maybe they're world history, maybe they're your history, but whether it's world history or your history, uh, you you will remember that and that will be meaningful and anyone can do that there have been several times where i was rolling up to a trick that i was trying for <clears throat> hours yeah uh -huh. maybe even actually both of the two the most like significant examples of this were tricks that i were trying for a couple days of like mm. different periods of time and I was rolling up to both of these tricks. This is not a thought that I had anywhere else in the process. But I had a thought cross my mind that you are landing it right now. Oh, when you feel it before it happens? It wasn't oh. feeling. It wasn't even feeling. It was my brain. Literally, I had a, the one, I had a conversation with myself on my way to the ramp. I was like, my brain was like, you're landing it right now. And then my other half of my brain was like, what if I don't land it and you're wrong? And then the other one was like, nope, you're you're landing it right now. And that was the moment that I landed the five tap, no footed can, which I yeah. don't know. If it, <laughs> that was where I five tap, sit down, no foot can, bring it back, land it, and then hop in. And it was literally, it could not have been more perfect. And it was in a moment where my brain was like, you're landing it 100% right now. And what was also significant about this is that there was two people standing on top of the ramp at, while it was happening and they were being loud and it was distracting me. And I was having these uh, thoughts while yeah. these people were distracting me. And then I went up and did it and it could not have been done any better. So I guess... In a little bit, like when you talk about the voice of frog bars, like, yeah. like that would kind of be what I would equate that to in my own head of like, I don't, I'm, my brain's talking to itself. And for yeah. some reason it knows that I, this is about to happen. And that was the second time that that had happened. The other time I was rolling up to it and it was literally like, this is happening. This try right now and you're going to land it. And then I did yeah, there's something about burning the boats, total commitment that like puts you into a completely different state. There was this one time, um, I want to say it was Todd Tebow and Anthony Adams Todd had come Tebow. down to OSU. Yeah, shout out. I I I called nine one one on Todd Tebow when he didn't quite get back on a no hander and did like a Miami hopper to flat. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. So so uh, so so they came down and I. I I hit this, there was this like an OSU when you go between Lane Avenue and you can take the uh, the path back to like <clears throat> Clintonville. Mm -hmm. There was this just dirt lip and you would go over, it's probably, I don't know, eight, it must have been 10, maybe 10 to eight, eh, eight or 10 foot wide. Okay. And I was I was full out heading towards this, and uh, I had this flash that just said, "You don't have a helmet." No, 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 no. I hit it. I hit it, 
just straight away uh, 360 look back and I cleared the landing. So it must have been it must have been a 12, 14, 15 foot mm-hmm. jump, which was one of the larger ones I had ever done. And I was like, damn, that felt so good. And I went back because my buddy was at a had a camera. He's like, do it again. Uh, and I headed towards it and I was like, I don't have a helmet. And I, I pulled it, but it wasn't amped and tweaked like I did the first time. And I was like, what are you doing, dude? Like hitting hitting something like that, like no pads, no helmet. Yeah. Uh, but it didn't like wrecking and not pulling it did not even occur to me. And it was it was dialed. It was perfect that first one. The second one is a little scaled back because I had hesitancy. But um, when you put all of that out of your mind, that you bur- you you burn the boats and you just have absolute clarity of what you're going to do with total precision. Uh, that's dude. That is a wonderful feeling, no matter who is in the audience. That is one thing, but that's not what happened. Whenever I'm talking about, because it was in the middle of a heated battle of hundreds and hundreds of attempts messing up (laughs) and it was on my way to another one of those hundreds and hundreds of attempts where my brain just Uh, said this is the one and and it wasn't like you know how sometimes you go to try something you're like this is the one it wasn't like that it was yeah it was a say to yourself versus when it's just telling you that it is right it was like it was myself floating above my body saying Uh, this is the one (laughs) that's awesome yeah. I, 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 I love seeing that. Andy Pandemic, I'll tell you a story about Andy Pandemic. He worked his ass off to learn decades. And <clears throat> I think it was last year at Battle with Alliteration, which is actually Battle of the Rockies. Um, he pulled a decade for the second time in his life in his run on his second attempt. Nice. And like nobody... No one in a contest goes for a trick for the second time they've ever pulled it in their life. And so shout out to Andy Pandemic for doing that because that is that was a total uh, Thunder World moment that he had. Yeah, that's amazing. In a contest for crying out loud. Yeah, that's that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. So like this, 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 this communing with frog bars when you're going for a trick once you have that feeling uh you can't you can't forget that feeling like you're you you were doing that what five tap no foot can Mm -hmm. that's how you described it yep hundreds of attempts but then but then you just felt that it was going to be the one i didn't even feel it you just something told yourself something told me in my something head something told you it was not even like there was no feeling it there was no nothing it was i'm on my way over the spine and something's like hey this is the one and then my other side's like what if it's not and you're wrong and it's like nope this is the one i'm right and then that was the amount of time it took me to get from spine to the quarter pipe and land it i have this all on video too like i have i freak out and i like sit down on the ramp afterwards and I, I forget exactly what I say, but I, I, I'm going to watch it because I literally already have it pulled up. I'm going to watch it again because I don't think you'll be able to hear it. If I, I can play it for them, for everybody else. Play, yeah, play it for everybody else. So I'm literally on the other side of skate park coming over the spot. So I land it. Holy crap! <laughs> Holy crap! No freaking way! <laughs> no up, freaking way! I was rolling up to the ramp like this isn't happening. I'm watching this kid out of the corner of my eye. I can't land it right now. And then it just yeah. Weird because I right there I'm literally saying like as I was coming up to it, my brain's like this isn't the right one. I can't land it because there's this kid. And the other side distracting me, but then the other side of my brain's like, 
you're doing it right now. It's funny, like, sometimes when you have those distractions and you make the choice to not be distracted, incredible things will happen. Yes, sir. I agree with that. So we can either make this 13 minutes longer. So it's uh, three hours, 43 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Like, do you have a time counter on it? Like, I, I, no, I, I would I don't care. I, I, I would go another 13 minutes just to end. Oh yeah, we're exactly. At three, we're at three and a half hours right now. 11:43. Yeah. I can make it end <laughs> at 11:43:43, or I can make it three hours, 43 minutes, 43 seconds. If you want. That that is my preference. Okay, we can do that. Uh, <laughs> it's just okay. So let me go through my my list, and I'll I'll give another story of a crazy one that I had. Okay. So, uh, another, oh, I have, dude, I scrolled right to this one because it just makes sense. So, uh, are you aware of David Goggins? Yeah, he's a tough dude. So, he was doing a live stream, bringing people into his live <clears throat> stream on Instagram to ask him questions. Mm -hmm. And I had just gotten home from riding pads weren't even off yet like this was midnight i had just gotten home from rays not quite midnight whatever it was but what happened was that i got home and didn't do my normal take the pads off take a shower lay down thing i just mm -hmm. sat on my computer doing whatever i was doing and then i noticed he was live and i noticed he was bringing people in and that the person who was bef like who was on there was wrapping it up and i'm like all right i'm gonna wait until this person is done i'm gonna push the request button and he's gonna bring me in i know it happens like and push request notification david goggins wants you to be in their live video Whoa. and it was the exact same i literally have it written in my notes exactly the same as the five tap no foot can where my brain just knew that it was going to happen. And and you want to know what I went and did, whatever this frog bars moment happened <laughs> with David Goggins. Instead of me asking him for advice, I gave everyone else advice and said, I want to talk about the concept that luck favors the prepared one. Nice. And so he's like, that's pretty good fucking advice, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's just whatever i mean he may not say those words exactly but i have it screen recorded somewhere it, it, it sounds you put the intonation on like it was like it was him oh was, and that was a moment of like i just knew that it was gonna happen and then it happened and then the very next note uh there's this crypto dude that i watch who he is crazy. He'll leverage trade and make like hundreds of thousands of dollars just on a live stream. And when he goes, when wow. crazy stuff like that happens, he'll just give money away because he can. So he, he was doing in the way he does it sometimes is he'll set up a bingo game where everybody joins in with a certain password and then he's calling numbers and whoever gets bingo first and submits it and does everything wins and gets whatever money he decides to give. And I had a feeling through the whole thing. I just knew I'm going to win. I'm going to no win. Way. I know I'm going to win. And like, it got to the point where it was like, it was far away where like we're deep in this thing. And I'm like three or four numbers away. And it was like three numbers in a row that hit for me. Oh, no, I lost him. Is he back? You're kidding me. Did his phone die? No! It's funny because the time code just hit 3.33.33. Wait, wait, wait. Is he back? Is he back? Hey, there. Uh, what was the last us, thing you heard? One of us. You were just about to tell the crypto moment, and you said it's the craziest thing, and it just and I was like, oh no, the so the bingo. interwebs is 
preventing you. Yeah. Okay. So it's the bingo thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, the bingo so thing. Pick back up. he's, he's picking numbers and, and I just had that feeling like, I know I'm going to win. I just know it. And it got deep in the game and I'm like th- three or four numbers away from even being able to win. And it was just uh-huh. like three in a row, just boom, boom, boom. And my heart's like, <laughs> this is happening. I'm winning. And then like, a I'm going to be a crypto behind. millionaire. Not quite that, but he, and then the last one, boom, there it was. Bingo. Send it in. Wow. Congratulations. You win. And he sent me the money right then and there. And I, I won. And I just, it was another example of like, I knew wow. for some reason, something was telling me and it, I knew. And then it happened in these situations. Like it's hard to discern between your brain telling you like, Hey, this is happening. And then the possibility of it being wrong. Like whenever you're like riding and you tell yourself that this is it versus like these situations, but every Uh, single time it's been this significant, it's been right. It feels different. Like, I'll, I will, um, uh, so there, there, there are, there are times when I'm like getting close to the end of the session mm-hmm. and I'm making progress, but I've, I've given myself a, a time that I have to end yeah. and I'll, I'll say things like, this is it, this is it, this is it. And if I'm like, consciously saying and forcing this is it uh it usually is not it like i can't Mm -hmm. brute force it to be it however if i feel something different in one attempt and i'm like ah wait a second like i found the sweet spot or oh wait a second i'm uh i'm a little bit I just got to dial it back a little bit. Like if I'm doing this, like bomb, 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 like finding it. Yep. If I conclude, Oh, this is close. That is different than me saying, Oh, this is close. Like, yeah. If you're, if you're choosing the words to say, I'm going to get it next time. Uh, it usually doesn't work. Right. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll choose words like, it can happen next time as opposed to it will, right? Like shaking your finger, like it will. Yeah. But then there's, but then there's the feeling of, Oh, I felt something that means it's close. Mm-hmm. And then it gets a little bit closer and it's like, ah, oh, it's happening. It's happening. And so same words, right? It's either you saying it's going to happen or, ah, oh, 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 it's totally going to happen. Like a realization versus a command Mm -hmm. and um, same words. But and that's why you have to be like so subtle in your understanding of your self-talk, because if you have if you if you conclude that, wow, it's going to happen. And you use those words and you think, oh, well, hey, I said those words in my head. Maybe I can just bark commands at myself and make it happen you will miss you will misdiagnose the situation like intuitively you'll be able to you'll be able to tell that uh that it's happening next yeah that that makes sense intuition that's how it works for me yeah i mean that 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 that, that's how it that's how it has worked for me like i've never commanded myself to do a trick i've concluded and there's a difference between commanding yourself and concluding uh, that, the, that the trick is right there next. Like when I'm riding at Chango with um, my mentor, Scott Powell, um, and like uh, this happened one time with, with Ryback where we were all shooting for the same trick. I think it was hang five, pull up straight to hitchhiker. Mm. And we were just doing them like in a train one after the other. And we'd, we'd watch one another and we're like, oh, it's right there. It's right there. It's right there. And um, 
like we could we could tell by from one another's trials who like who was going to hit it next yeah um but like that's different than you're going to do it you're going to do it you're going to do it it was more like ah i see it i can see it i can see it it's just you're right on that path keep 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 going down that path yeah that that makes sense and i can see the difference there for sure it's definitely weird i need to find the uh five tap crank flip one where i had the same thing that was the original one where it happened so we, we we have we have two minutes and a few seconds until the magic three minutes according okay, we, to youtube yeah i'm wondering if i end it according to youtube's clock or my uh live clock on obs youtube's clock or youtube's time counter youtube has a time counter on here because i push go on my software but then i push go again on youtube and that's when it you, starts to go live yeah so you want so you want youtube because when you hit stop you want the youtube to stop so that the episode is three minutes and 43 seconds uh, th- three hours and 43 minutes <laughs> My God, it's 43 40 seconds o'clock. too either way it, no matter what it's going to be 43 minutes but we you, might not hit could, 43 seconds we'll see <laughs> That would, be, no matter what we're talking about, immediately hit the stop button. Okay. Like even if we haven't finished it. That's fine. That's a synthetic forty-three that we put through. I told Ray that I started uh, moving my uh, my checking accounts to mm-hmm. keep forty-three cents in it, and, and whenever I would pay my bill, I would pay it with. I would round up the dollar and add 43. So I'm sending 43 so through the financial system. <laughs> Maybe it'll work. Maybe it'll work. I'm excited. Someone, someone's sending those numbers. Yeah. I'm really excited to do another one of these and just talk. Now that we've got like the uh, definition foundation. of things and the foundation, yes. we can just talk yeah. about examples and, and crazy things that happen and have happened and as things happen because i got a whole bunch of notes on these situations that have come up that are just kind of my proof can people put uh all right so i'm reading 1043 over here what's the youtube is at three hours 41 minutes 42 minutes oh got it got it got it got it got it okay good 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 um yeah hey uh can people so people because it's live and I know they can comment on live, but once it's on playback, can they also add comments? Yeah, it just turns into a video. Okay. So people so people can add their comments of their frog boss experience into the comments. Yes, that's what we want. Yes, this is comments. this is what we want. This is what we want. I fully want to see everybody's situations and and I was really surprised Got one minute to 4343. Uh, <laughs> I was really surprised when I posted an Instagram story just talking about that whole uh, dinner choice on the way home from riding situation one time. How many people were like, yeah, you got to pay attention to those things. And so I'd be curious to hear other people's things like that. It's all going to come flooding out because you have a lot of people who trust you yeah. and they're like, oh, my boy, Brant, uh, it does not lie. And he's telling uh, he's telling the truth. And holy smokes, it sounds like something that I have experienced. And so you're, you're, you're opening the floodgates. My Instagram messages are open. We can talk about this anytime you want, people. And just let me know because I'm excited. Joe, this has been a very awesome chat. I appreciate you. His links are in the description, people. We're going to do it again. There will be part two, three, four, five, six, and beyond. But for now, see ya. (laughs) 43.